Hello there, friends, subscribers, new friends, new subscribers, friends of Michael Todd Schneider, and all around fans of Michael Todd Schneider. Tonight, we're doing something very special. It's going to be from what I understand and what, uh, what Michael Todd Schneider understands is going to be a possibly a first in, uh, in history having a, a film uh, having a film being recorded during a live stream and the chat will be able to put up questions to uh, be asked by Lucifer Sky during her interview of Michael and I'm going to do my best to get them up on the screen as quickly as possible. Um, going to try and uh, try and make them uh, make the questions relate to the questions asked by Lucifer Sky, and we're just going to try to do try to do that uh, kind of weave it into the interview if it's at all possible. So be patient. Uh, we will try to get through all of your questions in the chat. So try and be as patient as possible. I'm going to be stepping into the back uh, backstage just to uh, tend to the chat. And I'm going to um, I'm going to put on full screen so uh, Michael and Lucifer Sky will be able to they'll be front and center and i'll be in the backstage i'll be bringing up the comments as they come along and just wait if you can uh, we will uh, we will be getting to your chat or your comment or your question as soon as humanly possible but i want to kind of dovetail it into lucifer sky's uh questions if it's at all possible so Bear with me. As you remember, two weeks ago, we did the interview with Michael, and he had this uh, amazing idea to uh, live stream the recording of Last Maggot Standing, Hatched, which will be included in the Box of Maggots release, um, which I believe is more, so, more or less scheduled to be released on the 23rd. I'll let them clarify just in case I'm wrong on that, but that's my understanding. And make sure to visit Maggot Films website and store and get yourself a copy of uh, Box of Maggots. It's going to have some really great material and some amazing interviews and all sorts of extras, I'd imagine, as, as is usual. Uh, with Michael's uh, releases, and you know, do what you can to support support them. Uh, it's it's going to be uh, quite a release. I bought one, so I'm quite excited to see it uh, come out. And if you haven't gotten your copy, go there and order one. Um, I um, that's that's really all that I have to say for now. If you understand what the general idea is, just uh, just let me know in the chat, and I will be getting to your question as soon as humanly possible. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Michael and Lucifer Sky, and that is... I'm going to have to check really fast that they're ready to go. But, uh, and then we have a little surprise for you at the end, or they have a little surprise for you at the end of the interview. And um, it's going to be very cool. Thank you all for showing up. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lucifer Sky and Michael Todd Schneider. All right. Michael Todd Schneider. Hey guys, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get in the backstage and is, is everything cool with that intro? You good? 
I'm just gonna yeah. get it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll be. I'll put the, the first question. Like over on the delay over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. It's really confusing. <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and step out. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. We're 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 good. Are you able to mute your microphone? Yes, it will be. Are you able to mute your microphone? We're, we're good. Are you able to mute your microphone? Yes. Okay. It will be. All right. Are you able to mute your microphone? Perfect. Say, so, Mikey, hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Groovy. <laughs> um, so to start this off, I'm going to take us back. Um, to the late 90s, you're in college, um, studying industrial design technology, am I right? Yeah. And a part of that course is film studies. So, no. What was the module called? Remind me. Industrial design like, technology. But then you did, a part of that was basically creating this, a short film. Yeah, there was a, a two-part film class because many okay. of us were there to pursue special medical effects within mm -hmm. the film. So you were on that trajectory to becoming um, an SFX artist at that point in yeah. time. And that is when Crapitus was born. And it's Crapitus that I want to begin to ask about and your processes at that time. Because I know that's something that you have done different iterations of and are currently working on a new iteration of it. Um, Take us back to that and your processes at that time. It was a big turning point because I felt pursuing this crazy dream was impossible because CGI was being painted over and an idol of mine, Rick Baker, retired early. And ironically, the first trip out to LA, uh, failed job interview thing with VH1. But that's why I was out in LA. The only famous person I met was Rick Baker in a pub. And my friend was like, you've got to look out for Maggot Films. And he's like, Maggot? As in Maggot? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, cool. <laughs> and I was like, I'm never changing a fucking thing. I got approved by Rick Baker. Um, but at that point, there was a voice in my head saying, why are you pursuing this? Rick Baker retired early. And, but I was burnt out. I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. And I got this film class and my other friends had dropped out. They were all out in LA and they were working on films and they are to this day. They actually you know, are keeping that dream alive. It's, it's still possible, but I didn't feel it. And uh, but with this film class, I, I went back to my apartment. Uh, I put a, I put a, a um, play by play it was like 87 short films. One was like 45 minutes. One was an hour and five minutes. Look, I can make a feature. And he's like, kid, Todd Gabani, that was my film teacher. He was like, kid, like it's a two to five minute short just to learn how to create illusions for a screen. I don't know. I feel there's something more. I feel I can make a feature. You're not going to film school. And he finally met me in the middle and was like, listen, you can stay on through graduating, six months after graduating, you have access to the equipment. You're a genius. So like that became the journey of making my crap this. And I was learning all these proper film techniques. And so even though the film is very experimental, I was trying to apply that language and learn. So interestingly, like, because the film held such a significant crossroads of projecting me into the ether of the unknown rather than pursuing something, even though it was in my mind at that time, uncertain. Within that, I wanted to learn the technique and apply that to something that was a little off rack of, of, of a proper film, mm -hmm. but I wanted to learn the process. And so the, fir the first iteration, which 
in the editing, and that's why I became obsessed with going back and to try to see it through because I only had a week, nine months after graduating when I shouldn't be in school, I'm walking into school and, you know, breaking the law, you know, as a homeless kid. And um, luckily, I immediately found friends and had places to stay and that were in support of me pursuing whatever this radical dream was, because I really didn't know anymore either. But in that, like, because it was only a week, what can a week editing a feature film do with believing what your your actual ability is? And so that became a little bit of a, let me go back, see it through, put it to rest. And I originally finished it on my 21st anniversary, 21 years later, on the 21st year, I went back and did a release and that saw out a, a, a distribution deal with a dream distributor. And here we are putting materials together and this all goes well. We'll be on that release mm -hmm. as well. And just to see something through that transformed your life onto a whole other trajectory, which took many years to actually see the weight in the, the worth, but the actual language transformed to realize better because you have that experience to transfer over to what you were trying to do when you were 18, 19, 20, mm -hmm. 21, and actually like put that voice to rest and actually allow it to sing. And I want to ask about that process of revisiting work, because it has been a couple of decades since you started that overall journey, but with um, a movie like Predator that you have like kind of worked back into, how has that process of like revisiting works from when you were younger, um, both kind of like logistically, because obviously tech changes, but also like psychologically as well, there must be a lot to it. Yeah. There's a means to not Lucas, the uh, end road, <laughs> but to actually be honest with the intent and actually realize what your voice was at an early age because you had that experience to actually complement that and then interestingly, like with this final iteration, using multiple different generations of cameras, it creates a really interesting like dichotomy of, of um, experience within, which enhances because you see us at different ages. And so if, if we're to explore this, why not actually embrace that and actually look into the mirror and actually acknowledge this passage of time for the benefit of the experience of the film. There are, you know, a couple of films that they shot over with, with, with children growing and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And we're not doing that directly, but it's like the artist that won't let it go. Mm -hmm. But in that, I think there's something to, to learn and grow from. And apply that early voice that really angry, confused voice that is, has an honesty that you don't get later in life, mm -hmm. but you're able to hear it and you're able to like sing to it and, and do a little dance. And I think there's something magical about that that you can't do again, because you're going to do it, put it to rest and move on to other things. and. It's really great. Having done this, it has allowed this release coming up. So there was merit to, you know, actually acknowledging this thing that totally changed the trajectory of my life. Because otherwise I would have just been a cog in a wheel, which in, in essence, I would have been happy with because I love making monsters. So it's not like it's a bad thing, but 
but I, lo I had lost that belief in my ability because Rick Baker retired early, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Rick Baker, like, so we put um, a message out before um, recording this to, you know, fans, friends and people that have been following your work for a while and, you know, to basically, like, the questions of things that people might, you know, want to know and find interesting for you to talk about. And a few of those um, are centred around your influences, like your favorite directors and things like that so you mentioned um rick baker and i want to ask you about others that have influenced your work so right from that early age where you started like to now early on tom savini being an fx artist a stuntman an actor and then later a director and his mantra was the more you do the more you get to do and into, of course, the most known director he worked with locally, George Romero, all of his films, his film family. There was something in that that always spoke to me and I struggled with because I, I just, I, I, even younger, I tried to be realistic and tried to think, well, practically, I'm going to do this thing. And, but as I grew, you know, and then David Cronenberg spoke to me, I saw it. Video drum when I was 16, and I was like, Oh my god, the crazy ideas in my head that I'm sketching in my sketchbooks and things could be a commercial film. And then into college, I discovered Dario Argento and all the Italian films, and and uh, you know, Michel Sovi with Cemetery Man, Del Marte, Del Moray. It, it, it just, and then David Lynch. So I went to Incredibly Strange Video, and Bruce was so fucking cool. He would create this chemistry with everybody that came in and be like, I know what you need. And he, he, he was like, here you go. And I took Lost Highway home, and it had just come out, and I... Of course, I worked around the clock on my school projects, and so I put it in at like three in the morning, and it's two hours and twelve minutes or something. I mean, it's a it's a it's a big movie. I was perched on my bed like a vulture, and I screamed, "What the <laughs> fuck!" at like an hour and five minutes in when the mystery man comes on. So like, thus David Lynch became one of those gods, and then and then he's like, "Oh, but you've got to see Hodorowski." I'm like, oh my god, I've heard the name. I've seen the pictures, and and then I I take the holding out now, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, every fucking shot. How did he pull this off? And to have shared time privately with Joe Coleman, a painter and a performance artist, whom I had read this interview with in Toxic Horror, that transformed me as far as performing. And just the interview, that alone, like when I came to the crossroads to do Mortem and stuff like that, like that voice was in the back of my head. And to get to be in the same room with Joel, and then we're getting to meet Podorowski. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing moment where he held us, he held us like, and first me, because I was the young one, and Joe just stood over there like the proud uncle, you know, <laughs> and then I walked over in the corner and watched him have his moments. And, and I told her, I was like, I saw your illustrations in art history of surrealism and shot for shot when I finally saw those movies because they weren't attainable. They far exceeded. I mean, it just, I can't fathom how you did, you know, and before he left the country, he wasn't leaving his hotel room to watch the DVD that I gave him. And a year later, he said to them, He's an artist. And that moment kept me fucking going for decades. Because it, it allowed me to believe I was on the right path. And those moments take you. And then I saw Possession. And I asked Max, who co-wrote Money Hell, what the fuck is that movie? I repeatedly asked him, and he was like, Possession, 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 
Zulowski, Zulowski. I couldn't shake it. Like it was so insane and so incredible. I now have all of his films and they are like the religious experience getting to like drop to my knees and like, you know, pray to the, to the gods, the film gods. I know like you had quite an interesting journey of obtaining his films and that of his son as well. Yes. His son's films are equally as incredible. And his father knew he was passing. He did one more film and then he, he wrote a script. He knew in his gut his son was going to direct. And his son was, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. He had it set up as an anthology and he was going to work as a producer and then every director fell off and then he was like, oh God, I guess I got to do it. <laughs> and then he was like, knee deep in it and was like this is what my dad wanted and then it became the ultimate tribute to where when you have taken in his father's work and then you watch what his son has done it is such a beautiful tribute to where it's like my god if only to be that like lucky to be in that situation because if you know his father's work to such a degree it is the most beautiful tribute and it, the film itself it's its own voice of his father because it was a it was his last script mm -hmm. so it's this little you know like <laughs> thing of their voices because mm -hmm. his son has his own voice but it's so pure like Cronenberg's family his son Brandon I'm like you know at the theater like oh my god possession oh my god infinity pool Jesus Christ like ecstatic and now his daughter has a film coming out so it's like the Cronenberg's alive and well, and Cronenberg's doing another film. And it's, yeah. It, the one is not so bad, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would you have some questions coming into us? Gaspar Noe and Harmony Coran, others that we mentioned there are amazing, but yes, yeah. yes, continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, we have some questions coming into us right now. Through the magic of modern technology. <laughs> yes. So we've got nightmares are sometimes influenced by what we watch, but have your nightmares ever been influenced by what you've created? I like that question. Oftentimes, Kramer, <laughs> I have not slept for weeks because I don't know the answer and it becomes a walking nightmare to where finally there is a moment of lucidity where I will wake, write, sleep, wake, sleep, wake, and the answer is there. The most extreme was opening the mind, which spanned 17 years. It was the looming thing to put the past works to life before we can move on. Pursue a new, you know, work in the industry a little more heartily, actually like apply for something, you know, actually like pursue something rather than the, the, the few opportune times that things seek you out, actually pursue something. But in my gut, it was, I want to put things to rest. I want, Every, everybody that was a part of this journey, I have such love for all involved and I want to put these in. And so there was a, a large sacrifice and that spanned 17 years. And the last monolithic thing was this crazy thing opening the mind, which started as after losing the opportunity with Fangoria, almost getting to do a movie before they closed and then revamped and everything, like it was close call for them and us. And they would have done one of the three scripts we wrote and we would have had a theatrical release. We're talking back in 2002, like a long time ago. And on the ride back from the last meeting, I felt it falling through our fingertips as well as theirs. 
because the investors were just sitting on their hands. And so I wrote this idea for something I felt obtainable. And ironically, it was shot on a camera that had three formats within itself. So it became complicated when there's 80 tapes across three formats. Like you can't get that shit to play. So it became the unobtainably completed thing that once the right timing worked out, it could be. But once I got that shit captured, which was by a camera Dave Graham had, of all cameras, I tried so many cameras, and then he was like, try my camera, save it, and it worked. Finally, as I'm editing it, but how does it live up to a 17-year odyssey? Mm -hmm. And then you go through, I, it was at least three months. I didn't sleep. I was days sleepwalking. And finally, when my body was so broken, I sleepwalked through the night, walked downstairs, saw myself at 22, 23, when I originally started writing the thing. And I'm typing. And I looked over and telepathically, as said in the movie, like I reenacted it as authentically as possible. Everything needs to be done. And that was how it was realized. That's the most radical of them. But the, like the first scene you're in, that was a dream. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say a nightmare, but I mean, we're in a cave. I'm vomiting it profusely with blood vomit. So I guess there's a nightmare element, but I remember telling you about a week later after I digested it and was sort of like, I think this could be like a part of your first visit. Yeah. And they found these caves that we went off in and, and found and then went miles into the ground. And it was an incredible shoot. I can't believe that was the first shoot that we did. That's quite incredible. But it's a little nightmarish for me when you almost bit my finger. <laughs> <laughs> I got so comfortable um, biting into this fake heart that uh, you know I sort of missed the mark when I couldn't see where I was going anymore. And, yeah. <laughs> I think that was on the third day. Yeah, on the third take, I was <laughs> over, over, over uh, zealous and just went for it because I, I knew the energy going down, you know, and felt comfortable enough that, oh, we're, we're there. We got it. And I pull away and you're like, my finger's still there. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took all my self-restraint up to scream. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... You mentioned, you briefly mentioned Dave Graham, and there were like a few people asking about um, different collaborations that you have done, because there have been many. Um, and also, like, I know from what you've shared with me that you've been working with sound in very interesting ways for a very long time, since you were like eight years old, right? Um, and then there has been a bit of a journey with like guitar and things like that. But it would be really cool to hear from you about um, how you approach sound and how sound influences what you do in general. Being the first recordable medium because before I had a camera, because I, I like aspired to a camera, I was obsessed. But we had a record player that had a dual cassette and I just started obsessively recording tape to tape. And before I knew you, anybody else knew you could do it, I started to like record tape, you know, pop mm -hmm. the tape and then record over the tape. The layer of sounds. And as they degraded, you learned to put the prominent sounds up above and then record the earlier sounds because they would degrade and drop down in the mix. And it was kind of interesting even in that early age, that, that started to become a thing. And it wasn't until Mike Probst, who was my first roommate at college, where I discovered this was a, like a genre. Mm -hmm. I didn't connect it. Um, so when we started to make Crepitus, I did a short just before Crepitus that I scored just to see if 
the crazy shit I was doing would marry to picture. And that began that journey. But it was, I mean, you're talking, I would have been 19 or 20 from eight to then. Yeah, that's quite a, in, in those years, that's 30 years. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it feels like in those years, in those years as far as your trajectory. Um, and that's when I connected it to picture. And if it weren't for meeting Mike, who was a good friend of David Graham in those early years, but they were in mutual bands and there was a whole thing of, well, I don't want to go up and overstep Mike's boundaries and talk to Dave. And, and, <laughs> and that there was a whole thing there. And eventually after many, many years, we had a good laugh because he was like, you, you haven't said hi to Dave. And I'm like, well, no, I mean, he's your, it's like, dude, it's been over a decade. Like you had your chance. Like, so it, like he came back to town. He was in Detroit at the time. And we all stayed up till sunrise and, and we finally broke that ice finally properly. Um, but in that, like the connection the three of us have is so unique um, to the voice of the films because there is a sort of a back and forth that complements one another to where if it's not something I can do, Mike can do, Dave can do, you know, it's like you bounce off that triangle. And then there are other voices within that that grows, it spirals bigger and bigger and bigger. But at its core, that's the voice of the sight and sound because we have such a unity for so long. And I, I, I so look forward to when we get to actually sing on a proper budget because mm -hmm. these guys have careers far beyond what we are capable of. Like Mike should have a pop career doing every every fucking genre possible. And Dave, like just there is an atmosphere within him, which which Mike described what it was like when I first approached him. If we could if we could put his sound to picture, he was like he couldn't. It's it's far exceeded in its own sound. You couldn't put it to picture, it'd be too much. So you know, here we are. That is the proper like Mackin experience. Like there are a multitude of, of, of voices, but the sound is so fucking integral. Now I have an ear, it's not a trained ear, it's a, a partially trained ear, but how I hear that and reconstitute it to picture is A voice, a voice that I don't know. I can't put a finger, but it. After so long, you start to like accept. It, ha it has its place. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And tell us about because um, there have been so many like collaborative moments over the years with different people. And it would be cool to hear about like any of the memorable ones that you might want to share. That's a hard one because it. You want to go through a, a play by play of everybody, but you can't. Because there's been so much. That's that actually is, the awarding, factor of the the, the twenty years within Maggot, is is its own voice. Everybody holds their own, mm -hmm. in such a beautiful way. There is no way to give voice to all of those. Obviously, Ben has a huge place, but it's boundless, everybody. Um, One thing that I like very much admire about you, um, especially like since having to more deeply know your process, is you you very readily give people like the freedom of expression in their own unique voice within what you're doing and then kind of having that you know really inform your own practice and that's just me kind of like you know having watched and observed and the way that like you know we've worked together as well and I don't know many people that have it in them to be able to do that to be able to like relinquish some of that 
control if you like so yeah I it's a hard thing to re respond to but I do know what you mean for me the magic of being an artist is to sing with another artist mm -hmm. to create a unity you know and whether it's two or three or a whole it it depends on the situation but to create that environment and then to complement all of those voices mm -hmm. is far more exciting than just look at me like I care less about me. Like I care more of finding that unity mm -hmm. and actually allowing those voices to sing. You mentioned Mr. Ben and we have had questions about how you how you met Ben? I'm looking, um, as random as this sounds, looking at a mandolin which is on the table in front of us right now. Um, so that was Ben's instrument, which I believe was given to him by a friend. Yeah. And I'll just explain a little bit about kind of how I got to know that instrument and how it is in the state that it is right now. So. I came here like last August when we like physically met for the first time and I kind of saw that in a corner of the room and thought oh great it's a it's a mandolin amazing it looks really old and interesting and started trying to play it and it was like wildly out of tune and the tuning heads were like because it's such an old instrument um it was kind of impossible to conventionally tune it but throughout the time I was here that first visit like kind of you know we ended up kind of like recording and collaborating and just sort of like having fun with it and then we basically got it refurbished they told us it was a hundred years old and just it was quite special given if not us meeting to actually reconnect with something I had held on to that had been Ben's from a friend and was like in the corner of his room and a shelf and everything. And then it just brought back just the context of, of, of when, how, which way, when they refurbished it, brought it back. And now it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's wild those recordings from before, there's a magic to them. There's a voice, and then that is because you had like given yourself to it in a way that was special. Because you you had taken in its significance to me. Yeah. And I had only haphazardly played with it, like jokingly sending friends videos and stuff, because it was so personal that I had a hard time sort of subjecting to it being um, a serious instrument, which is kind of a, a strange dichotomy of sorts. Yeah. But I guess it makes sense, you know, because mm -hmm. it's too, too close. Absolutely, and I feel like, so I had, of course, like, I've never met Ben, but I'm, I've, you know, seen him in your work, and you linked me to things that he had done, you know, previously in his career. And, you know, you were always sharing things about him. And I, through this instrument, strangely, it was like the only sort of tangible connection that I would ever have to him. I didn't really, con I didn't consciously think that at the time, but reflecting on it, no, it's it was like kind of... It was a natural, yeah, evolution. Yeah, yeah. and um, so I... Um, I have a bazooki and a mandala as so of fairly recently and so I was like really just interested in it as an instrument but yeah like tell us more about tell us more about Ben because 
people have asked about that and kind of how you met him and how, you know, things evolved with you working together. We met on a theater production. I did his makeup and then I helped him up on stage at the beginning and the end. And he, he was like an immigrant. It was a it was a, a retelling, a fictional retelling of Shakespeare's story. So he'd come out like an immigrant. He would, he would he was sweeping the stage. I could be doing this forever and you don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he pauses and he goes, what a fucking mess. And because of his candor and he's, he was like ultra hunched over and really leaned into his age to where he looked 130 everybody lost their shit and night after night the escalation of loud laughter got and i was behind the, this the curtain you know ready to help him off stage and i was just he's reading the audience he's feeling the energy he's sensing the thing and it was an incredible feat night after night the, the last performance, he got the biggest laughter. You know, he like escalated it to the climax. They got the best he could get. And I had shared a VHS of a film I was editing at the time called A Tribute to Sanity. And in the time, there was an opportunity to do like an alternate version. And then it became the final version, ultimately, because it was like, how can Ben not be in this? to where he played me at a later time in life. And that was the first time I felt a director. The first time I was filming, all the actors were from that production. Queen Elizabeth played Ben's girlfriend from back in the day from the movie that played Elizabeth, that April Radzineski, mm -hmm. that was in the original iteration, a close friend of mine. And, and uh, Sean Raleigh played a version of me later in life, you know, sort of like stepping on my shoes later in life. And, the, and he, he was the one who played Shakespeare. So like, it was the first time I was working with actors I respected and loved from that production where I was filming something and they actually, acknowledged me as a director and that was the first time where it was sort of like a bit of a light bulb because that movie was sort of a are we pursuing this or is this fucking south you know should i get my shit together and have to la and just do effects what in the, the this was the the crossroads um and that moment, yeah, that moment was very transformative. Mm -hmm. Very transformative. Because they all, we, we all fed, and it wasn't a perfect shoot. Sean's son hit his head off the air conditioner, had to go to the emergency room. And he was like, I don't want to take any brother, you know? And we're like, <laughs> we just shot everything run and gun. And, and so that's the final iteration in, in that movie because it's very urgent, you know, and, it, and we all know, like, um, when I see it, I'm like, oh, man, that's, that's right, that's right. But, but that set a foundation, and it was the closest to a Scorsese and De Niro sort of, like, chemistry mm -hmm. for me as an equivalent of, of director to actor to a degree that where we had such um, a connection to where when we were filming or rehearsing or whatever, we could feed and bring something beyond our capacity individually and actually manifest something larger. And that was the incredible thing with our friendship. Above and beyond our friendship, that was manifested of its own thing that saved me as... Um, at a crucial time, but on the film front, 
took me to another level. And that was like a mutual thing. Yeah. And so, it like was. from what you told me. Yeah, it was. Ben was pretty much tapped, just um, retired, doing an odd thing here and there, thought his day was done, hoped his memoir could be published. We almost got it published. It was at a bad point in publishing, which it's even worse now, but his book is so incredible, so inspiring, and when the time comes, it's on my bucket list. I mean, that was one of his last wishes, you know, and that's on his final leg. That was the thing I was like, oh, fuck it. We'll self-release what we've done. I want you to know our stuff's getting out there, what we've done, because it's it's special. He had a hell of a career. He told me he met Salvador Dali. He did. When Dolly would get on his knees and play with Ben's dog, Maude, and we'd, oh, Maude, oh, Maude. And Ben would just sit there like, a, you know, like a, the, the grumpy parent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he'd be like, oh, hey, Ben. Uh, uh, how are you doing, Mr. Dater? Yeah. Um, but that was, that was like his time in New York. Just go to this walk in North Park, and Dolly would jump down and play with Maude, a little wiener dog that Ben had. And, yeah, he and met so many amazing people. Yeah. Like his like really sort of intense and long standing connection with Ava Gardner. Yeah. Is one that you told me about, which is like just fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, he got to be her personal assistant as well as Jackie Gleason's mm-hmm. at off times. Saw both of them naked for two different reasons. <laughs> Ava's for good reasons, Jackie for You'd never seen a boy in his birthday suit. He's like, what do you mean, Jackie? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ava, most beautiful creature in the world, then she'll have her first fucking margarita. And it's like, oh, God, Jesus Christ. But they were both, like, huge, wonderful experiences as a whole. And they, they were just bottle caps of time of the revolving clock of, like, explosion to great to okay well oh, here we go again and you know we're off again to the races mm-hmm. they both had their their uh, canister of every emotion you could possibly imagine in the time they shared and so ben grew from that and came back to pittsburgh eventually after he had a, a, a dubbing studio in madrid and he dubbed hundreds of films into english that were um spanish Mm-hmm. and he directed the dubbing. It was Emmerich with Studios. He did the voices for a lot of them, and um, some really good films, actually. That... Anyways, I could go on and on about them for five hours. Yeah. And <laughs> um, tell us about when Ron Jeremy's new job. <laughs> so, I, the second work for hire movie, directly after Return of Red, a week later, we were off and I'm doing effects. I have to learn a German accent to play this vampire. And Ron impales me with the pickaxe. And now we're in a real cemetery. We have a fake cemetery in the backyard, but we're in the real cemetery. And the stunt guy, Johnny Sullivan, who I became close friends with after this, is showing me what to do. And he's jumping up on a tombstone. And he's, jump up. Jump up on here, Michael. I'll show you what to do. Just jump up on here, Michael. And just don't. <laughs> and, and and so I do. And, and then the, the gravestone falls for him. And it's like, producer, director, just fucking do it. Fucking crazy. So I, I, I step up and I'm like, oh shit, oh shit. Johnny's like, Mike, just, just listen to my voice. Just listen to my voice. He's gonna he's gonna stick the pickaxe under your armpit and then you're gonna fall back and you're gonna you know, pull it away. And but it was it was extreme heat to where I'm wearing a suit 
and I've got my eyebrows sh- shaved off. I've got this part of my head shaved off, pale pancake makeup, and I like, and I've got scleral lenses in, uh, vampire teeth in. So, leaning back into the sun, it's ten times harsher because you have no no protection, okay. and just sweats going because you don't have. You don't know how much importance your eyebrows have until they're gone. <laughs> and sweat's just, in, you know, because you, you've shaved the top of your head. So, like, all this sweat is just right in your eyeballs. And Ron's down there. I got I got you. I got you. And, but I don't have my balance. So I, I slip. And I'm falling directly on the fucking pickaxe. About to be impaled. By a real pickaxe falling, my feet were about three feet up on a real gravestone, and I'm falling. And just before I fucking land on it, he manages to pull it away. And I land on the back of my neck, an explosion up my spine. And I'm just like, just in complete shock. But then Ron leans over my face and goes, Oh my God, I just saved your life. And I couldn't stop laughing because the sweat in my eyes, the gleam of the sun. And it was just like, if, I mean, I'm in in my early 20s. So it's like, if this is to be my end, (laughs) Ron Jeremy, you know, saving my life. And and I, I started, I couldn't stop laughing. And the director was like, oh, you're okay. And I'm like, no, I'm, he grabbed my, no. So I laid there a while later and eventually I was okay. And then, you know, I did break my hand on, on the film doing stunts later. And I did have severe burns and run. There was the, the for reshoots later. We had a real pack axe that was welded to where it was like a fake plate. And it was duct taped underneath the suit. I think it was duct taped under, but I had severe sun because of the, um, a horrible sunburn. So I, he was, as he was jerking on the pickaxe, it was just reefing into my sunburn. And somebody was like, "Do you know how bad a sunburn is?" Like, Why didn't I tell you? And he's like, "Oh my god, tell me!" And I was like, "Well, I want to get it over with." <laughs> Flash forward, I broke my hand. Last day, Ron was on set. Had his head in a couch we cut the couch hit his head put fake shoulders neck ripped his head off so we joked printing a shirt ron jeremy saved my life (laughs) and on the back sort of ripped off his head still hasn't happened to this day but it still makes me fucking laugh (laughs) i'd wear that shirt (laughs) We've had a question come in. I think you have probably already answered this, but um, somebody that would like to know, what was your first feature and um, what exact age you were when you first started? First feature? Mm -hmm. Um, My crop it is on my 21st birthday was my first feature. So there was like 87 short films. Uh-huh. One was 45 minutes, one was an hour and five minutes. So there was the, the cranny when I was in high school. It was like 45 minutes. And then The Neighbor Guy, which was about an hour and five minutes when I was in college. And the proper feature was, for whatever it's worth, my crop was on my 21st birthday. I want to ask about you to delve into um, those previous, the works previous to my practice because I know that there's so much that you've done, um, like works that you've done with like Tom Colbert, for example, and others. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear some of that. Bloody Fun Pictures was with Tom and it was a magical time period really because the works we did i knew in my gut it was a training ground for what i personally wanted to do but 
communally with what we would do, there was a voice to what we did that was sort of like Evil Dead to a more punk rock level, you know? And uh, that's fun. And I really would love to get back to that to some degree, whether we were to do a short or a feature or something like that. Like, I would love to reconnect with that world in, in a way. Because there was a purity to that. There, was, there wasn't, as much as we put an expectation to being right, it was a fun and a sort of a, a party aesthetic. Freedom. A freedom that we weren't putting the seriousness into it. We were trying to be silly. And, and something I wanted to do was a little heavier and a little more purging, like, you know, deep-rooted personal struggles and stuff. But with Bloody Fun, there was something that was just a complete party, like... Um, a means to like laugh, have a good time, learn the process of film, and just whatever happened, happened. I feel like there's been a couple of questions that have come in. Um, and something that I personally wanted to ask is I know that your creative process has a lot to do with like, exploring, like, the human psyche and the human condition in different ways and like how has your point of inquiry changed over the years because obviously there's that part of that process of getting older and like, experientially like becoming you know like evolving and how has that affected like how you creatively work I don't know that I've been aware of it of the changing because so many things have branched so many periods of time. But in that, when you, when you directly approach a specific project, there's a specific mindset to it. So it's a matter of applying the idea to it with where you are at that time. And in that, I think there is the opportunity to apply where you're at in life because they weren't so subjective to well this was then this was then and this one they you know there was the chance to go back and like put each to rest at different points and they um it crosshatched to such a degree that it's hard to say this was better than that or uh, any of those degrees but I don't know, to apply the different ranges of experience helps, but then also the naivety of the earlier years applies a subject as well because you don't have the expectation of what you can't do because you feel you can do anything. So there is a there's a power to that. And like with Crepidus, to complement that because before I was 21, I was in my hometown hospital filming i was in a hot um, um i was in the hospital i was in a church in pittsburgh filming like with complete permit with the people completely at ease i have not done that since you know those are two things i look back and i'm like well okay there is something to that but it also is subject to the time because there were I had specific people on that time. But now there will be this weight of oh we can't do that. There's there's this thing you know. Times have changed a lot in that and sense. Times yeah. have changed, but also in the voice of that, there's a, that duality. So mm -hmm. to flash forward, and how can you complement that? It's almost like you. You, for Crepitus, it's almost like you go back to even more bare basics to complement it, to get back to the purest of people and 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 shoot some things, and you complement that. But it's, I don't know, it's quite crazy in reflection because there are those moments with those two 
environments in particular where it's like there is no way we're shooting at a hospital or a church right now there's no way yeah. but i look at you know mana and we were in a club that was tr a transformed church which is now closed so we did in essence in the second era you know still do something in that ilk, but put it put it to a different degree mm -hmm. so it's all subjective at the time but yeah i mean speaking of locations um we actually before i get to that we've had a question come in um which was so it's um, referring back to when you were speaking about Romero, um, what was it like working with his son? And they have mentioned the screening, and if that will ever be the right day. Oh man, who said that? David Dunbar. <laughs> <laughs> Dunbar. Um, oh man, that leads us to this long and hour rant about the screening. On a show, we we grew so much on that film, and it is such a shame it never came out. I've talked with the executive producer; it doesn't feel like anything that's ever going to see the light of day, and it's a shame because we we grew exponentially. I mean, my uh, my know how of what I could do. I would walk into the unknown after having done that and just sing to the highest ascent because what we had pulled off on that film was so next level. And unfortunately, the version of that movie that exists doesn't sink to that level, but it's still a fun movie. And even at that degree, I would love to see it seen, but unfortunately, it it's just in the hands of somebody that isn't a part of film has it's just living life he's in he's in his later years and just couldn't be bothered mm -hmm. and we've touched base here and there and it's nice to touch base because he's a, a great person and that's one of the unfortunate things with this is these things sting hard you know, he's in it, his kids are in it. Like I directed his kids in very, very vulnerable moments when Cameron Romero's son was off crying off in the corner and I was like, I got I got this. Like this was how intense stuff got and how much of a family were we were and having that like we went off and we did some incredible stuff. And it wasn't something he was to be embarrassed of. Like, it was great. It was really, really good stuff. It's unfortunate. Because it probably won't have a proper release. And it's, it's very unfortunate. So for those of us who don't know, could you just um, briefly explain what the screening was? It was George Romero's first proper feature coming to Pittsburgh and bringing Pittsburgh culture to sing Romero. And it was fruitful. We all found ourselves, holy shit, Eric, you're here. Oh, Midian, you're here. I mean, literally everybody I knew in Pittsburgh was there. And we all found ourselves there. I took Nikki to our first audition. And I was like, listen, actors go to the 500,000 auditions, nothing comes, don't have any expectation, comes out. I got the lead. Calm down, calm down. No, 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 I did. And they want to talk to you. And I'm like, no, 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 calm down, calm down. <laughs> oh, that's the producers there. I'm like, oh, shit, oh, shit. I had a DVD I was going to mail to a friend in New York or something. Here's a DVD. <laughs> like, I can't, I can't do a reading. Like, that's terrifying to me. Next day, Cameron called me. We co-directed a short. And that's what brought me in. Like, we had um, energy. And 
I was brought in as a second unit director, but I didn't direct second unit. It was either we co-directed or Cameron wasn't there. And I directed because he trusted me and we had this synergy. It was such a production and it was unfortunate, you know, the tra trajectory it, it, it went because so many of us had, like that's where I met Benzie properly. I knew he was like a rival. We we designed opposing haunted house productions and we were like in promotion of Pittsburgh again. And I was like, oh, no, it's him, no, it's him. And then we sat down and we broke the script down the night of a big meeting and we and we had like 10, 15 pages of effects breakdown that night. And I was like, dude, you got your hands full. And he's like, thank you so much. You know, like we just bonded. And it was just a family was born. And that whole thing, we just, everybody that was a part of that production, where you were, you elevated to the, 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 the thousandth degree of your potential. The unfortunate thing was it, it never got to sing its song because it was something to be seen, but it wasn't to the degree of what its potential was because we did so much more on screen. But, you know, I had moved on and was making and then I helped and a lot of the crew had gone on to be a part of that. So I wasn't a part of the post work and I had, I had all the notes where everything went. I wasn't a part of that because we were all just hitting the road to a severity. Or it's quite unfortunate. Cause we, if we, if we had rode the same fucking road and just put it all into the same, we would be singing, you know, to the high gods at this point. But, you know, as is the case, you all hit different roads and, and everything. Just before we got that question, um, I was going to ask, and this is taking this away from this trajectory that you've just been down, but about like finding locations like locations to film what has been your process with that and any like interesting problems that have arisen through it too the most exciting with locations was in that helped because we were setting it in the 70s and it was only intended to be a part of an anthology so as a short sure we can make it sh like a short set in the 70s and we were off and we were looking at a different and we were like that fucking cabin would be amazing but it was in the middle of town and the driver our friend's best friend like father's best friend was like I know Whitey he, he built it in the 70s they're gonna burn it down there like in a few months I was like shit like that would be perfect if we can prevent them from burning it down in a few months you know until we're done <laughs> and so like we went and we looked when we went, and then it was like we went back and looked and whitey got back and he was like yeah you guys can shoot there i was like oh my god oh my god so we go in and we look and it was it was the undertaking but we found a front yard about an hour or so separate and we did some trick photography and that shots and stuff like that to where I storyboarded the whole fucking film and I mean if you went this way a hair you saw a house looming up above because there was a house like 10 feet from that to the cabin if you went down this way you saw the, the main road you went this way, you saw the signs. Like, it was so strategic that it was in the middle of town. And there were power lines, there were street signs, there was houses. You were in a whole neighborhood. But if you shot it the right way, so we blocked it very strategically. And nobody has ever questioned it. It just feels like you're in the middle of nowhere in the 70s. And it's 
it's magical. Like when I watch it, I'm like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to the back of that world, you know. Like in a world I got to be a part of, and I got to be there. And but I think back, it's like because I'm meticulous who went out there and framed these shirt. If you got down on the road on the other side of the road, you couldn't see the road. It, it, the grass would go. So if they hadn't cut the grass, we could get a shot. So we would like time it to where we give the one shot. It would look like you're back further. And, you know, it was just, there's one second. There's one, you know, like there were just these, boom, 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 boom. And no one, and, it, and, it, and then it blossomed into a feature. And the fact that we managed to encompass a feature in the 70s, mm -hmm. that was such an accomplishment because it was only intended to be a part of an anthology. And that it was reasonable. But because we had digested this sort of thing, it was obtainable, but once you commit, you're in that world, and you know, when you get back to it, it's like the cabin. The cabin is like the source of that. Everybody wants to make it a cabin in the woods movie. We got to do it, and it was the perfect cabin. I mean, if you had a choice to choose that cabin, that's the fucking cabin. Because it was handmade by a dude named Whitey. In the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> genuinely 70s yeah building by himself yeah yeah everybody told me couldn't do it so in that respect it gave us so much more mm -hmm. yeah that we could well there's like the story behind it then isn't yeah. there and that's like more of a sort of intense connection to it you know that the person that made it came across like their own hardships and things like that and like there's a couple of questions that i've written down to read as they were written because they were just so like interestingly but um so one is from a friend of ours um dave chopping from australia <laughs> <laughs> so he asked being a man of endurance, what feeds that fire in your belly after all these years of burning passion? Obviously, the fuel that feeds your flames has evolved over these 20 years. But what makes you go, fuck you, to all the shit that happens during the creating? I think it's just one of those things that you find day to day. And it forces you to look face to face and just suck it up and just say, fuck you. You know, I've got something bigger than just to measly through existing. And you trudge forward because you have an inner voice and a a sense of being and it doesn't mean you're bigger than anything or anything it's just we equally should have a point of existence and leave behind a sense of being and i would love to look around me and watch everybody's worth i would love to look at my neighbors and see why they've got the same unfortunate thing with that is what would there be that brings that fucking fire well I want to fucking have something to say all said and done you turn that screen on kick back and that voice is forever you know it brings a sense of mortality I think between, you know, but beneath the surface, the sense to, to sing forever, whatever that is, there will be those people that tune in. And, and for anyone that's an artist, there is a, a, a peace in that, a sense of peace to know that moment you have has worth going forward and somebody else can see something in it and they can they can pave it forward 
and put forth their own as other artists have spoke to me so to such a degree i feel i'm at a place of worship when i watch their work and not in a way that's weird i feel so um i don't even know the, the the right word but when i get to be in that presence i feel such a degree of worth to to it to be in that presence of their voice and to sing their song and you bounce your own voice off of that and then it brings back a reminder why why do you do this why do you want to do what you do and there is a, a magic in that that's so relatable and like you part of a current aren't you this sort of ever flowing and ever evolving current and no that speaks to me and i'm sure that is going to speak to so many people that are watching and listening to this as well um yeah i mean can you um share with us about things that you are currently working on what, what the future holds for my good films well we have all american devil which is coming soon <laughs> um there are several scripts in development which we will see but we're at a point where we feel maybe some spec scripts like like critting um almost as earlier films that have spawned where they create like short film iterations um they may spawn like the foundation to see them through to the fruition but there yeah there's at least three sound scripts four four mm -hmm. um i rather not say the names because they're different different degrees but i mean there is a dream project from 1997 that I finally cracked the last couple of years and I'm about midway from the first draft. I'm really excited to return to that and see it through. And I would love to shoot the opening sequence for it as a, as one of those spec scripts, like skits, whatever. Um, there's something Dave Graham and I wrote that would be great for that. There's just a couple of iterations, but yeah, as, as far as moving forward to the next chapter, there's some brewing beneath the surface. We'll see what it takes off, but yeah, the hope is to see something to the next level. There was another question that came in, and I was trying to have a look for it through my notes and it basically refers to a point quite a poignant moment in the past while you were filming and a bumblebee looked across your eyeball yeah shooting my first feature Krobodos it was a day I didn't have anybody with me. I just had a camera in hand and was just off filming. I'm wearing institution pajamas, walking on the beam beneath the trestle of a train. 10 feet this way, 10 feet that way on a little, you know, section you can walk on. I'm in the middle of the 
bridge, if I just fell one way or the other, I would probably die. I guess pretty well 100 feet, likely a death descent. And I've got the camera and I'm filming and I'm not thinking anything of it. And I see yellow fly and it lands. And I, was that yellow? I should probably keep my eye open. And it walks over my eye. And it walked. It did literally walk over my eye. And as it flew away, I saw yellow. And I'm like, okay, cool. Good choice. Kept it together. And then the train came. And that wasn't time to get back to land because I was out in the middle. And at this point, my adrenaline, I can feel, is about to kick in. But luckily, I had trained under martial arts and things. So I'm calm the heart, breathe, think of prairies. And the train comes. And it is when you're thousands of feet in the air and a, in a plane and you're in that funk where they're like, we want to prepare you for some turbulence and you feel like it's the end of the world. Well, I'm on the end of the world balancing my life, you know, one way this way to my death, one way that way to my death. And having just had this bee walk across my eyeball and I kneel down and I've got a camera in my hand. And I don't want to lose my footage and I don't want to lose my life. And it's just shaking the shit and the, and there's rust falling and I'm barefoot. I'm wearing institution pajamas. Quite a, a ridiculous moment. I wish was on camera and I, the train goes, and I just calmly stand Breathe, breathe, breathe. Last three steps. I almost fucking lost it. Fell 20, 50 step, you know, feet, whatever. Would have been bad. I would have broken a leg or something. It would have been bad. Almost fell. I managed to keep it together. I flobbly came back to the landing. I was like, oh, next time I'll bring a friend. I was like, what? So there's a witness? <laughs> when you fall but after that shoot after we wrapped they put a fence we went back for a, a tribute to sanity and I was like well I can climb the fence but I can't expect everybody else to so the footage in Necropolis is self inclusive to that world and it is my favorite footage of that movie it is so fucking cool and I flipped it like when I'm walking one direction to the other. I'm, I just, it was a simple flip. I just flipped it like a mirror image. But it looks so fucking epic. And it's really quite, uh, I agree. it's really, really atmospheric. And it was the first stuff that Mike scored mm -hmm. as well. It was, it was the first moment of feeling like you are a filmmaker on a, on a journey, you know. But it almost cost me my life. So, I mean, I guess it makes sense that it would it would it would come to an expectation of well i guess it has worth but it is quite wild because i don't when i see it i don't see it as such a you almost fucking died for that i don't see this that i see it i'm like oh it looks cool <laughs> like i just the aesthetic of it only when i recount it i mean I know that um, you say, like, you've shared that your, like, martial arts training has had quite an impact on you. And also, like, your personal trajectory with, like, training your body as well. And that being, you know, something that has really, like, saved your life, essentially. And I feel like quite a lot of us would benefit from hearing that side of things because that's not only like a personal thing it's like I know that it's like tied in with your creative practice as well because it's giving you that new like breath of life and stuff so yeah. let's hear about that well interestingly like flashing back I took Goshen Jutsu and Taekwondo when I was real fucking weak and in those moments 
that voice came back to me. And then later in life as well, as well as many times along the way, I mean, I, I had an actor when I was managing a haunt, like get a, a knife pulled on him and I threw the guy like clear across the room. And it was like, there was some fucking ghosting to this too right there. I didn't even know it was happening. And the dude was flying 20 feet from us. And I was like, holy shit, let's go pick the dude up. We don't want to one kicked out of it. But like, there are, um, the, the, the psychology was so ingrained in an early age, um, between those two in a very positive way. And Van Damme was a very big influence and I trained to do splits and did split between chairs and stuff. That's how influential he was. Um, but it was the, the discipline and the self knowing and awareness and inner peace within a moment of catastrophe to actually see a means to bring the, everything into a, a quieter moment. So like on a movie set, shit is a fire. Mm -hmm. And within that, if you're able to bring everything in and just bring a calm to the storm to where it, you don't even know you're doing it, but it's it's ingrained in your DNA from that training. You can bring us all back together, and so that that does become like a strength to that that world that is alien to that because you're going off to make an indie movie. You're generally not coming from a the like karate place, you know, like that doesn't sure. seem part of that DNA. But there is a part of that psychosis and DNA that I do, I do, I do see a through line because I, like, in the train thing alone, I'm walking barefoot, wearing pajamas from an institution, mm -hmm. and you're walking on this rusted train trestle, you know, like, like a madman. Um, and climbing up the scaffolding and stuff like that, like, is quite maddening, really. But with that mindset, like, it doesn't seem that mad. Like, it's all a matter of bringing a sense of peace and what what's what's on camera and, and everything like that. We've got a question that has just come in from somebody named Kirk Owen. Um, when's my next part and when's my next script <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> you're going to have your throat slashed tomorrow at 9am um, uh, Kirk is great um, he is the first actor to perform in something I did when I was in college when I was sort of at this French crossroads, per, you know, pursuing effects. And I got my camera back to Pittsburgh. And the first thing we filmed, my neighbors across the hallway had a fire extinguisher. And Kirk was in his birthday suit with fucking, like, like, um, I'm trying to think of underwear, the white, the tidy whiteies. And uh, he's like, all right, man, all right, I'm ready. And and his roommate is, all right, man, just hoses him down. Because we, we had a fire extinguisher that was, like, ready, you know, with the water. But, like, it looked like he was just flushing him down. It's, it was called Gimp. That was the first show we did when we were in college. And it was Kirk, and it was the first actor. And uh, it was a, a very transformative part because it, that became this synergy. He was a part of Crepitus, and he was a part of um, The Neighbor Guy, the first like, feature-ish thing I shot in college and stuff. But yeah, Kirk's just a great character actor. And um, 
artist, makeup artist, kind of a do it anything guy that is an absolute inspiration just to think outside the box. He asked Kirk, hey, can we do this? All right, man. All right, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Um, refer to a couple of questions that we've had in essentially about psychological space and like the aesthetic of a lot of your work because you use a lot of like intense and interesting imagery and as you've shared like it has been this kind of journey through like the psyche in many ways and how does the kind of like interior and exterior like reflect on each other this in with the imagery that's kind of an abstract thing to ask but i don't know there's a outright voice i think it just happens naturally It's just acknowledging that synergy. That almost seems too natural to even actually acknowledge them. Uh, it's a matter of standing back and actually watching a specific work and actually and, and breaking down where one piece breaks and another is there. I can't say that's like consistent thing in that regard. So would you say that perhaps it it's an organic process in terms of those decisions and then kind of reflectively looking back on it. Yeah, yeah. You can make sense. Yeah, yeah, it would be a like a specific thing to where you could actually acknowledge it and actually uh, feel a sense of where you equally were like the the artists how many were apart but but that collaboration because each thing has its own trajectory and that is what's exciting is there are only two stories that are the same and there's maybe two stories that are the same of um any specific traje trajectory and that's what keeps me going back is because it's not just beating a dead horse like you're you're setting different parameters and you're trying to rediscover your sense of self like all all things all things like not any specific thing um it might be inclusive to that you know a piece of either yourself or the world outside of yourself it's it's specific to the, the project so I don't know it's hard to pinpoint that we've just had um, a question come in I think you have covered this somewhat um, but we've had who is your biggest artist inspiration I wouldn't say that was the biggest artist but it was it was the building blocks which I touched upon of Sabini Romero and then Cronenberg and then Lynch and then Hodorowski and then, well, no, oh, what, the, those voices. <laughs> How about musically? Because they have a big play yeah, too. Yeah, um, know that. Uh, Dax Riggs actually is the first voice that spoke to me as a writer that made a little, the language of writing make sense. And early on, my connection with Ryan O'Neill at the time, his girlfriend, Lisa, kick-ass Hamilton, no longer together, but they're still good friends. But we emailed for years, and the language of communicating back and forth developed my own voice. But... Dax Riggs' lyrics spoke to me to where 
words started to make sense. And then later in life, Michael Jira's lyrics within his own, whether it was with Swans or his own poetry or anything he writes, also to the second stage of life. Like I listen to any one of his bands every day. Um, I'll listen to something. And I'm like, it doesn't quite. All right, cool. I'll listen to something else, but I have to like, I have to like get a a, a bit, and it reminds me. Yeah, it, it reminds me daily. Of, it reasserts uh, my own personal sort of trajectory because there's just something, something in it, you know, where it's uh, an artist you appreciate, and you're on a similar trajectory. You're on your own. You have your own thing, but there's something that reminds you why you're doing what you're doing and it sets you back you know i need that daily reminder and it's it doesn't matter how many times i'll like all right i'll listen you know i'll get halfway through it and i'm like all right i gotta listen to some swans or i gotta listen to some angel of the light or whatever it's just yeah mike props for like introducing me when we were like 18 college and it was he planted a seed <laughs> i want to ask as well what do you think this far has been your biggest achievement i can't say that any film or anything like that is bigger or less because I feel they all have their own place and they all have their own point in time. Like soon enough, my first feature will have like a really nice release, but the other films don't have any less of a voice. It's just that's its time to sing. And it wasn't until S. Craig Zoller wrote that article in Fangoria when it hit, it had like, it was gone. And it came back and he reached out and it was just like, hey, um, I have a column and everything. And he wrote a column and I literally broke down in tears reading because it finally brought perspective to what we had done. And it brought a significance to what we had done. It allowed me to actually see it finally in a way that I hadn't before that because I'd felt a failure. I'd felt I hadn't made it. I had, you know, they were, they were a step towards something. And I, it wasn't that I was any less proud of what I had done it with the parameters or whatever. But it was the first time I saw it on a face value where I'm like, you know what? These were some to our level and with without limitation within within parameters that they should not have been what they were and you know and there was um, a degree to that that it just allowed me to finally see and find a sense of pride finally that was not easy because you're always your own worst critic um but that was the first time i was able to see and and, and finally see and face a wall of, of, of realities where, you know what, this is a sense of you have done something. You have actually faced the unknown and actually accomplished and seen films through. And that, that is a few and far. So can't say that any, I can't see what that is. <laughs> Did you find the answers you were looking for? Is this the end? 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 Is this the end?
Is this the end? Is this the end? Is this the end? Is this the end? Is this the end?
You're a fuck. You're a fuck. Look into sidewalk what do you see Well, while while Michael runs to the bathroom real quick, I uh, I'm gonna check with them to see if they will continue answering questions that have come up in the chat. And this was totally new to me, but I had to scroll through each and every one of them um, and identify which were questions and which were anecdotes. And I. I used a a list. I was able to star each of them, each question that um, was um, submitted, and the star list does not go by chronological order. So I have to flip back and forth between them to see which questions came first, and um, I'm going through them as I can. Yes, he might have. Well, he's, he's, uh, his camera has been disabled. Let me see. Well, I'm gonna, I don't know if this is good for me to do, but I will unmute them. That It's possible that they, um, Please don't strip off and go jumping around the lounge room. You know, the best uh, 
some of the best stuff that came into the chat were comments and wow man and there's still a few questions that need to be brought up and answered uh you know and um i uh i am not totally certain i'm gonna turn the mic back on just in case um and see if they want to cut the stream or if they want to continue answering questions and I'm just going to give it a go. Hello? Are you guys through with uh, the questions uh, from the chat? Hey. Hello. Do you? Uh, I, there's a number of questions that came through in the chat. I don't know if you guys want to, if you want to go through any of them. Uh, yeah, um, I just was uh, trying to check back in. That was killer, man. Was Creep, it? I, creepy as fuck. I, to I totally went off on a, a zone, so I, I don't even remember what the fuck we said. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do it, man. That's performance art right there, man. <laughs> awesome. Everyone no, in the chat was enjoying it too. It's, it's uh, excellent. Yeah, no, I, I just was trying to. I heard you talk, but it was it was hard to, because we had muted it, but it would, wasn't entirely muted, you know. But I heard you a little bit. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was trying to check back with all our shit we had on. Oh, our okay. laptop, there's this um, um, a touchpad thing, and we thought about oh. that last minute as we were talking, and um, and the computer wasn't charged for it so oh. we we're trying to like pre-charge it um, yeah but, i i uh, i didn't uh i didn't uh get too many of the questions out i uh, you know there's still but the, yeah uh, let me let me let me try to get the um i'm trying to you know i'm gonna try to turn off the uh recorders and then we'll we'll, we'll go through and answer everything else oh cool okay let's try to try to get like a Okay. okay. And Let's, you, you got to see some of these comments. There, the, a lot of it was anecdotal. I'm just gonna have. I'm just gonna have stop on the studio camera and stuff. Okay. Just try to. There was a question. Okay. 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 Let me mute mine. Maybe that will help them with the feedback situation going on. I hope it was good, though. <laughs> oh, they're fucking playing it. How the hell? Um. How y'all feeling out there? How you doing tonight? And uh, the the next question in chronological order. Here, we're going to turn their mic back on. The next question in chronological order. Here, yeah. we're going to turn their mic back on. Their Is our mic back on? Yes, sir. Here, Is it yeah. back on? Yes, sir. I might have to just go into setting. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Let me fix that echo. Which camera is it? Is it that one? I don't know. <laughs> oh, no. I think it's that. It has to be that one, right? It's possible. If you have... I don't think there's two of them. <laughs> it might be the your monitor. 
We only have one in the in the room. Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. 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 I think we have it figured out. I'll just let them. Here, I'm muted okay. just to. Oh, there. It's gone. <laughs> okay. We hear you now? Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. Ready. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I'm, I've, I've, I've painstakingly been switching back and forth between live and starred comments because. I had to, you know, find all the, there's been a lot of comments and some of them were anecdotes, which you might want to read back through them because yeah. there, there no, were absolutely. buddies in there. You were <laughs> getting, they were, they were given some insider info on <laughs> just their experience with the end uh, um, experiences and such. So the, uh, you want me to just go ahead and, uh, read this one out or do you want to do it uh yeah any 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 little things we'll yeah we'll touch upon they hear us okay i believe so you're you're cool. good okay cool we got uh terrence mcguana he's my buddy from psycho babble live he's the main host and co-host and uh his question is what's the best on-screen dick ripping in a movie do you think is that too crude or <laughs> well i mean dick ripping that i've been on set of or dick ripping on a film that i've seen well let's start with any of your films has there been a dick ripping in any of your films uh that that maybe i'm not thinking of uh, it's well all right i went through phases so okay oh, let me turn off the uh, strobe for effect here did you, did you guys appreciate that a little? Effect, oh, little yeah. Little effect. <laughs> yeah. Um, um. So, in more to more to my think was the first was, you know, Eric James used a wiener of mine that I cast, and then cut his wiener off, and we did that thing. And then for hire, I worked on a film um, in New Jersey that was never released. And that went really well. It was actually quite shocking. Uh, and it was unfortunate, one of those things that was never released. Oh, no. Um, but going into Mana, I was like, well, I feel like I've done this before. What is the greatest asset of a man? The balls. Why hasn't anybody done the balls? The balls are what held the fucking gold to life. So we cut the balls off. <laughs> and, well, it was Johnny Sullivan, my stunt buddy in West Virginia, and I back to back with all the adhesives you could imagine. <laughs> back to back. Well, the duct tape fucking ripped everything off. That didn't work. And it was this and that. The scotch tape and the, the spirit gum we were back to back just doing all the adhesives and all the things and going through the motions the behind the scenes i wish we had that fucking video it was hysterical man mal Heflin videoed it it was so fucking funny we were we were like so matter of fact but in hysterics at the same time because it was just how do we find ourselves in this position <laughs> and and flash forward and uh there's a producer who was like what about directing a film where guys balls are cut i was like i feel like i've done this <laughs> and then it became a thing so i don't know i don't know it was perfect but that moment on man i was quite majestic back to back with johnny sullivan who was a stunt man who had been on fast times movies and um hmm. uh what was the uh um Wicked. um mm -hmm. oh jeez oh, fucking boats and oh, I, uh, 
Oh, it's killing me. Anyway, it doesn't even matter. But the fact he was on these like mega productions, but then he's flash forward and we're back on ours. And he's like, Michael, I got an idea, you know, and we're like back to square one and we're doing our thing. And, and uh, yeah, on the set of Man, he's like, I'll be there, Michael, and do our thing, do what we do. And we're <laughs> cutting our fucking balls off <laughs> like troopers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it was, awesome. you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question, but I many say times on set and cutting balls and fucking wieners off. But I think balls are <laughs> the prime de la, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it's a whole new level that hasn't been considered in our cycle babble chats. I was asked as a joke, you know, what the what's the worst dick ripping you ever seen and generally it's ignored in uh, most live streams but my buddy Terrence the, traditionally I every Saturday night on Psychobabble curly girl at the movies threatens to rip my dick off every time and <laughs> it's just become a running joke and uh, so I think you quite uh, you quite well answered that question um if you feel good with that, I can move on to the next one. I uh... absolutely. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Then we've got Stuart Johnson. If you were a werewolf in a movie directed by Panos Cosmatos, would you keep <laughs> those handlebars as werewolf? Spelled with where? Like where in the hell? Werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart, fuck you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh my God. I love you. He's got to be a close friend. I, uh, yeah, he has great. the insider info, man. Yeah, no, he's great. I I would love to. There we go. Live performance, take two. Um, I would love to do a proper werewolf film with proper FX, all that stuff. Like, there's a whole core of us that would just love for that fucking opportunity. I bet. And yeah, if the handlebar, you know, sticks out for that, sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. When, uh, here, um, the next question was from. Uh, do you do you want to elaborate any more on that, or are we good to move on? Yeah, we're good to move on. I think. Okay, this next one is from Dave Chopin, or is it is it pronounced that way? Chopin, Chopin, a little, a little okay. chopping just, pants. Like that, I always crazy. thought that. It, <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always heard when I read the, the, that name of the composer and whatnot. I can't, I can't wait to meet Dave in person. He's an incredible person. Very cool, very cool. And his question was, or is, if you could, if you could, that train scene would make a great scene for future short, uh, for a future short slash film. There might be a word missing in there, but if we could maybe use that train scene, it would make a great, a great scene for a future short slash film. I'm not sure if it references another question or so. Yeah, I'm sure it does. I'm, I'm trying to saying. connect it. I'm guessing what crap it is. I don't know. Po possibly crap it is with the train scene. Is that what he's? Yeah. Is that what he's? Uh... Yeah. Oh. What that happened to me in Mongolia at the black market? I tried to rob my mate, and I at knife point. I'm not sure that that's related, but it was one of his previous comments. Yeah. Can you? Would you be able to clarify for me, Dave, in the in a new comment? The short film feature. Mm. Okay, balls get cut, and the testy pops out, and that's okay. That's related to the last one. 
Christ. When you almost died, when you threw the guy. A train scene where you threw the guy. Oh, God. Wait, should I go into the thing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Just gonna, just gonna try to look on the thing too. Um, Please do. If you could track that that train scene, one sec would make a great scene for the train. Yeah, we're trying to relink back what you mean. It's kind of I'm cool, just... cool follow up. We didn't we didn't plan this. Everybody was watching. We didn't plan this. But this is right. kind of a cool uh, follow up. The, the the studio camera is not. I almost regrettably wish it was still filming, but it's cool in this regard because it's still cataloged. But okay. Let's see comments done. Um... Is there is there a way to log in to see the comments on her end? Uh, yes, there should. I uh, I got to make sure mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm pretty sure that there, uh, any guests are able to see comments. Let me just double check. Mm -hmm. Guests see viewer comments and posts. Guests can stream to their own. Guests can see viewer comments and posts. Yeah. It should be able to. Okay. So um... you just got to oh, go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you found it? She's gone there now, yeah. Okay, so okay cool. I'll the one from I spit on your group. Okay, that's somebody else. Nice. <laughs> Goals get person. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> um. <laughs> 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 the man's quite, a wizard quite, with uh, words. Sorry. Quite detailed, Dave. That was great. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wish I could talk. <laughs> you like how he answered? Well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> Check your messages in the last PM. Um. We, we don't have access, Dave, because we're yeah. like my phone's the main main camera. I mean, Dave, if you want to forward them to me, like I can check. Um, like, yeah, uh... <laughs> that's some good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I was having a bit of a trouble finding all the questions because th there were a lot of anecdotes that oh, I, probably I, would I make you bust up yeah. laughing and, yeah and i i uh i was trying to tell everybody i'm going to circle back through and just you know hit the next uh question asked um by name in chronological order yeah i fell, and, I fell into a zone i i had no i have no memory of what we even talked about like it's quite Meditative okay. in that respect. Should I have a quick hmm. listen? Yeah, you can pull up. All right, okay. I'm gonna. You just let me know and I'll put it on the screen if you uh, have a certain one you want me to highlight. Pull, pull, pull up, pull the audio. It'll be. Pull, yeah. Should I like? Yeah, pull. Up, yeah, just pull up the audio next to the screen. Pull, pull, put it up a full volume. Yeah. See if, see if it. it I it, was just thinking to do that. It, to be fair, like, it might, it might not pull up full, but I'll reintegrate. Like All right. Okay. Dave says. Mikey, Mikey Todd Schneider, Oi Schneider. Um, <laughs> the knife thing was when you took, almost got robbed and you threw the guy across the rain we're doing the gosh and jitsu thing and the train thing was when you were filming by yourself and you almost got ran over by a train i'll try and message on there and maybe you can have these i don't know fuck <laughs> <laughs> that's dave chubb and i love that dude. i'll put it on the screen awesome. uh, i have a certain one you want me to highlight Oh, sorry. Oh. So, um, Dave was 
there was there was actually um, a guy that was going to knife an actor, and I was I was the manager of a, a haunted house, mm-hmm. and we went out afterwards to celebrate, you know, a, a good season and everything. Sure. And there was somebody who was like, "I'm going to stab you in the fucking neck," and everybody was like, "Ha ha ha!" He's just fucked up. I saw the guy reach in his pocket and pull a knife up. And I went into memory reflex and grabbed the, the hand he had the knife in and, and did this flip did he do and threw the guy across the room. Wow. And at the same time, he spun around 20 feet that way okay. on his ass with his beer in his hand, spilling up <laughs> like this. <laughs> And I was like, holy shit, I just, I can't believe. And he skid on the, the um, um, it was like a smooth hardwood floor. Okay. And he fucking went 20 feet. And I looked over to my buddy and I was like, we better about pick him up. So we picked <laughs> him up. Let's get another drink, buddy. It looks like you uh, had a rough night. He's like, what the fuck happened? What the hell happened? What the shit? <laughs> <laughs> and the bartender was like, oh, shit. And we we're like, no, 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 we're okay. <laughs> and a few minutes later, you know, he started getting into this thing again. Fuck you. and This and that. And then his friend was like, I'm sorry. He's going through a bad breakup. Like, I really appreciate you guys for what you're doing. You're keeping him on his ass. <laughs> through every gesture it's actually not what it could be it could be you fuck the guy up but we weren't doing that we were trying to put him in his place sure. and have him acknowledge like come on get back to fucking reality mm. and um luckily he went off with his friend and seemed to be back to a good place but but yeah his friend was like i'm sorry he's he's like very suicidal he's he's putting himself out there he he wants you guys to hit him he wants you guys to retaliate and uh he, he he's feeling he he deserves everything and we were just trying to like cut it close and 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 uh so in that respect it it was a, a bit of a perspective change to where when somebody's fucking acting batshit crazy, maybe there's right. something else to it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. That it's a rarity when that happens, but you kind of try to neutralize the person, right? Or uh, yeah, make them no longer able to inflict pain or <laughs> injury. I guess. Well, to 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 uh, complement that as a story. I was sharing this mutually with a few friends in Canada. Okay. And it happened again. <laughs> oh, shit. We were in Toronto and this guy came up and he was hitting on my friend's girlfriend of 10 years. Oh. And I was like, he's, she's been with Ryan. This is Lisa. They're, they're, they're amazing. Leave them alone. Oh, you're kind of sexy. Well, you're going down, motherfucker. And I threw him down. Bartender turns around. Pick him up. Oh, we, we need another drink. It became an on-joke thing all night. It was like a recurring theme. Flash forward. We're sharing with another friend in Canada that story. And it happened like this. And then this guy came up and he goes, finger war. What, what, what? We're going to thumb war. One, two, three, four. And I, and I was just like, slam, win, slam, win. <laughs> and then he tried to punch me in the balls. And, and it was like, Ooh. dude, after the third time, you're going down. <laughs> and I looked over and, and, and Lex was like, it's like you told it to us, mate. And I was like, how the fuck are we three times over the same goddamn thing happening? So weird. Dude pops up 
I love you, man. And it hugs you. Like, I, I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man. The wild stories you get in the bars and stuff, you know, I mean, or whatever. Well, they're, they're, they, they were, they were all, uh, well, the first was a, um, rap party for a haunted house and the other two were rap parties for a, for for films independent films oh okay so you were out you know they, they, they we weren't just in bars we weren't just in that atmosphere there was like a significance of us being there sure and all all three different but it was crazy because the first was in pittsburgh and the other two were in 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 toronto but for radically different reasons but it was one was a premiere. One was at a convention. The third oh. at the convention, we were sharing the stories from the first two, <laughs> and then it happened again. And 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 Lex was like, "It happened just like you told it to us, mate." <laughs> like, like it was just like, "Oh my god, how does this shit happen? Like, how is this our reality? This is fucking crazy." <laughs> But in the uh, instant, it was it was it was rekindled to that connection to karate as a kid, because each time it was a whoop over the head like a lasso, like <laughs> in in everyday circumstance you couldn't fucking do this, but in those three circumstances, it was a lift did he do? Wait, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> oh, let's pick the guy up. Oh, let's get him a drink. You know, in <laughs> It was this. It was a sitcom narrative. <laughs> wow, man, <laughs> that's wild. Interesting question overall. It, it brought a lot out of you there. I mean, damn, nice <laughs> stuff. Okay, let's see. When uh, Dave was saying he wishes he could talk, um, it, it may have. It, I think that you must have totally answered his question. So, right? Possibly is that what he's is? Was that related to his question well enough? Um, if he's referring to the train scene, I, mean, I would assume it was the Crepitus train. But it there's so many train moments that were foundational. I mean, I watched Stand by Me as a kid. You know, mm -hmm. and I had I hung off the train like in Lost Boys because I saw it three times in the theater. <laughs> so there was oh, like man. so many foundational moments filmically um, with trains and uh, uh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, so many moments. <laughs> Oh, um, I think that it's possible that we uh, soon begin to cycle back through um, some other questions. Yeah, Let me sorry. just double check. Uh, la, 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 let's see. Um, It, there are a lot of uh, questions to to go through, so uh, forgive me while I fumble through here. No, cool. Tom was in here. Yeah. If you want me to send anyone a link to, you know, come up in the stream, that's you know, I'm it's it's totally possible if you just give me a yeah, put it in, put an email or whatever in the private yeah. chat. Yeah, I'd like fun pictures as, yeah, as Tom, yeah. Yeah, I know. But then... <laughs> There's one... Uh, I mean, uh, of course, we've got a whole menagerie of questions from um, Mr. D -d 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 Bill Kramer. And there, there's a lot of Bill Kramer's questions that, uh, you know, I was just taking one per person at a time just to make sure yeah, but yeah, like, good. Um, I was sorry. sorry. I was looking for um like Kramer's questions in this chat, but I don't think it's appearing for me here because it was sent beforehand. So yeah, it'd be good if you could. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to bring those up? Because I'll start at the the beginning of them because I think it's about 
uh, we've all cycled through all of the other uh, people asking questions. And um, it's 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 weird how this chat obviously yeah. it's been a learning experience with the way that the because uh, I feel like we tried to assert some of them because there was earlier questions that corresponded to other questions that you know yes yeah, and I I I accidentally uh, I was accidentally like I was like was that already answered and yeah I had to kind of kind of communicate with the chat and well, let's see uh well, da, da, da. if if you uh, you can probably see all of the former questions on the stream yard when you go into comments yeah um, oh, but. Um... Yeah, I can't see um, Kramer's. Yeah, it's cra it's crazy at the start of them. There's there's a lot of questions, but it is crazy how it doesn't start with his. Mm -hmm. Well, this was the we, the second we did, question. We didn't actually start with things that were touching upon that, though. Oh, hang on. Oh, okay. Oh, there's Alice too. I saw. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Alice, if you're still listening, thank you for staying up. And it's oh. like... love you, word <laughs> Alex. <laughs> see ya. Um, I recognize that name from the chat. Mm -hmm. God, I must not have properly cycled through every single question. You know how I watch it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. Alice, Alice Myers. <laughs> I think this is her first. Is <laughs> oh, that's so thank cool. you, Alice. We love you too. Uh, so, what is the, the quite great to see? Because I, I guess there's a swipe left that uh, Kramer found, um, where you can see the comments when we review the live stream. Oh, okay. But, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, we're hopefully. able to swipe through, and um, a good a good friend of Alice of many many years. She's the only other friend. Who sought me out through through mortem of any crazy film and saw something else? Okay. And Andy is the other friend. Like, can't I? Everything, <laughs> but in that they're the only two people in this world that that reached out and connected with me, and we've been close ever since we've connected online and. Um, it's really quite special seeing her shining in here because it's many hours later for her. Yeah. Oh, but, uh, shoot. Alice is from Sweden, right? Yeah, so she's from Sweden. I, I don't know. Yeah, she. It was uh, midnight when we start when we started. Oh, I think they're an hour ahead of the UK. Yeah. So it would have been eleven at night. It was. Um, it was midnight for when we started. Yeah, so but... I guess we're an hour apart. Thank you, Alice. We appreciate it. Um, Please don't strip off. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> 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 oh, uh, do you think if the the, the baby from Eraserhead would have grown no. up, would have been responsible addition to society? No, who's the? Hang on. <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? He's one of the friends from college. Chris, I don't know who you are, but I have such a connection to the baby from a razorhead. <laughs> I have made a paper sculpture of what the baby from a razorhead might have been. Like it I don't I just Let me try to find this to highlight it for you. Chris <laughs> Chris. Not to what? make a thing of it, but what uh, really good. Oh, here we At go. Least we were able to put the comments up on the documentary in a way. I yeah. must feel that would be you know, a little something. There's it's... no way we can hit all of them. I think the baby from a razor head has moved me <laughs> <laughs> more of than course. anything. Like, I just <laughs> but I want to look after it. Yeah, Chris, <laughs> he, he <laughs> was romance with Kirk oh, and cool. uh, another friend, yeah. Yeah, oh, it's and good to have you in here. Exactly. One thing I gotta know. Um, there's one question that came in that was quite interesting, and 
I gotta know what what it's uh what it's all about. Hold on. Uh do mm, here we go. Um d hold on, hold on. Does it have butter on it? <laughs> Kirk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> he asked it several times. <laughs> uh, early short film that Kirk and I um, made with Hoosier, actually. Um, yeah, that was, he had a stick of butter. And he was like, does it got butter? After you, like, he's like, does it got butter on it? And it's so good. <laughs> it's one of those oh, things that's ingrained in your like DNA. Sure. You can be anywhere in world in the world and you hear, does it got butter on it? You're like, why does that make sense to me? <laughs> <laughs> like, and everyone's like, like, what are you talking about, you fucking lunatic? <laughs> I, I but, to those, but to those that know, they know. Fair, fair. Chris is like, I remember the better eating. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. Let's see. Uh, do you want me to go? Did Chris ask a question again? I've, um, I've, really, I've really lost control of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're looking at the comments, and it's it's like it's I I love everybody all the all the names I'm seeing. Like I I love everybody that I'm seeing. It's like thank you everyone for it's just really being special here. with while while we were filming and trying to be in the moment. It was I didn't know who whom was coming up, but whatever. But now I'm seeing and. uh yeah, it's quite special. Oh, uh, Lord oh, Gary, Lord uh, Gary a needs a, a bubbling. Um, I don't even know how to put it. <laughs> I I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no, no you're fine. You're fine. I, I just I don't have words. I just really appreciate the friends from long past chiming in it's quite special i understand um lord gary was uh he was he was uh crying for a shout out from you <laughs> he's like what i need a that? big shout out oh. he's oh, back man. now he uh <laughs> I was I was like during the filming I was like eh, I don't know if we should do that man like d you know for the filming but now I suppose it would just uh if you give a big shout out to Lord Gary <laughs> back please him he's back now so I don't know <laughs> just well, looking out for you Gary we'll, we'll bleed some out for you <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lord Gary. Lord Gary. Bleeding. <laughs> Down <on> the throat. <laughs> Lord Gary. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite uh, crazy well. we saw the studio camera over there. Yeah. <laughs> Is it recording? No, I turned it off. It's, yeah, yeah. Sure, I wasn't sure if yeah. you did, but... No, I just because we'll have this recording as a separate, yeah, sure, separate uh, thing. Yeah, I can totally get you the the file. It stores. Yeah, no, it feels like a like a um, its own personal thing, me, my Bobby. You know, like sure, we were. Aiming to achieve something else over here, and there is something about like taking your glasses off and just sort of speaking across whatever is projected, and just trying to be in the moment, and then, and then, uh, yeah, lucidly like 
candidly looking at comments and it's a different, yeah, different thing big time it's really sure. surreal to think like no it's really it's really it's really cool seeing because so, i i had no um expectations of who was chiming in or whatever you know i just had to do whatever um but to um actually see some of their friends from over the years it's quite cool so um, quite touching really emotionally in a way really because there's people you work with but you do something and well they're off doing their thing so like you know you you learn to accept that and learn to accept the sort of soulness of things and ways mm -hmm. so moments like this you know when when people come out and they hit it really does recenter your soul in a way very well put my friend Poetic, if you will. I dig it. Let's see. Should I, should I pull up another one of the wild questions? They're good questions. Don't get me wrong. The Especially, uh, my gosh, uh, the, the, the first fellow I'm trying to remember his. I'm trying to get back up to this. It won't let me. Oh, here we go. Boom. Come on. Here's uh, another one of Bill Kramer's. Uh, were you self-taught? Did you specialize in any weapons? And why haven't we seen an epic maggot films martial arts fight scene yet? <laughs> <laughs> Well, in my youth, I was totally fan Dam in a younger, uh, younger day. <laughs> but um, life led me astray. You know, there wasn't the opportunity to spread my legs. <laughs> 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 Which could say so many things, but you know. Me was between two chairs, and but um, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, All right. I know, I know, I know, that was the purpose, but uh, but but in that, there was something of um, the know how of well, know your place. Christ, like, <laughs> stop spreading your legs. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah. uh, but it was a party trick, you know. I dropped down and popped somebody in their nuts, and, and they'd be like, "What the hell is he doing? We're doing, we're making monsters." And I'm like, what? "Yeah, that's right. That's a monster kick." Well, <laughs> but no, um, it it, it would. The essence was always in my gut, and it's always just Maggot Corner has its place. That's sort of the place where we can sing and do some skits and do some things. So I've exercised some of those demons within that, but within a context of like a, a larger feature that hasn't really been an opportunity. But the exercise of that and the mindset is always at bay because it's it's the mindset of just pushing beyond the conscience but pushing beyond the body's ability pushing beyond what we can do figuratively emotionally uh physically that has always been at the center at bay uh and i am always the oyster to realize whatever if i am to be the resource i will always re realize that if i'm able 
because that's an easier resource than asking somebody else to do that. That makes sense. I'll always do if somebody else can't, but I am not a female. So I will. And well, actually, there's times I've performed as a female because I just didn't care to ask. <laughs> Purposely, just to get it over with. Um, okay. But yeah. My body is a, just a resource. Sure. I, I totally understand, man. Whether it be fucking martial arts or to store me. That's a, that's a good answer, man. Good answer. When you see cycling, circling back through the starred questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. Um, oh, Legion's at one. <laughs> oh. Break out that absinthe if you want. Treat yourself. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> find, find that green fairy. <laughs> Let's see here. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Oh, well, while I'm up here, I might as well take one more. We we got the shout out for Lord Gary, but I wasn't able to hear. Hold on. He had a good question for you, I think. What is your favorite scary and favorite movie track? Oh, man. There's no favorite. Yeah, it's so hard to choose between the the vast array that you must be, you know, uh, fond of, you know, or that you. You know, really... if I if I were to refer to a moment, two three a.m. to leap up on my knees on my bed. Screaming at the top of my lungs, what the fuck was Lost Highway when he <laughs> said, I'm in your room right now. Call me. <laughs> I leaped up on my knees, screamed what the fuck, and was perching for the next 50 minutes, whatever, to the end of the movie. On my knees, like <laughs> at three in the morning. And the movie does not let down of that feeling when I revisit it. It still has that. It could Ooh. be three in the morning and I would still have that sense of unease. Sure. It is complete magic and complete put you in your place. Who are you? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And where the fuck are you? And where are the people you love? Because get ready. We're going to get down. <laughs> Lost Highway is a, a awesome film. It's one of my favorites by David Lynch. I got to admit. Crazy shit. Mind that, that moment at 2, 3 in the morning when I was a student at college it really brought perspective of the potential of film because it was just, I didn't think I'd stay awake. I ran to this. I, you know, I'd get back to it tomorrow. And then I'm up on my, a purse on my knees, like a lunatic. Like what the fuck is happening? Here I am right now. <laughs> Literally, this is me. I am, I am bound for two and a half hours twitching like a lunatic that's intense man and it's two three in the morning and i've got a roommate like 10 feet away you know snoring and and i'm just <laughs> completely lost in this moment and yeah. unbeknownst to him and everything else like the world around me is gone all i have is the mystery man calling mm. Bill Pullman and I'm mm. in your house right now. <laughs> and you're like, fuck! 
<laughs> I am fucked. <laughs> it's all done. It's all over. It's gone. Droop, the world droop. is over. <laughs> That's an absorptive uh, uh, experience there. That's really you kind of really taken over by the film, if you will. I mean, amazing. Oh, it's de it definitely transformative time for sure to experience like the potential of what film can do. I get that, man. Because I, I, I look, I look down, and my heart was pounding out here. Oh wow! <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> we're into another world here. Like, yeah, this is something to behold I was subject to something taking me out of body this was not I was no longer like in my bedroom on my bedside everything you know it really transformed the potential and I never I never lost sight of that because it was transformative Excellent, excellent. Let's see here. Uh, we're just gonna do Rick Owen or Kirk Owen asks, "When's my next part? When's my next script?" Did I already ask you guys that one? I think we did. Yeah. Oh, what? Unstar answered. Damn it! I'll take any role, but Santa Claus house that. <laughs> He played at Santa Claus off and on for 15 years. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, that helps clarify. I wasn't sure. I wasn't totally sure. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kirk's a great friend from long back. He's, um, yeah, the first short we did was Kirk, and he was the one I shot with the fire extinguisher. Oh, wow. Well, so he's from the act shot with the fox you know, sure. as his wiener and was like, You ready? And Kirk was like, Yeah, man, yeah, man. <laughs> and Huziak was like, All right, here you go. <laughs> and Kirk was like, I got it. <laughs> 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 it's a fucking hilarious short. We gotta upload that shit. Yeah, definitely. So that was the first short that he was in. Is what when we were in college, right. yeah, that was the first thing we did. Tremendous. Yeah, I met Chris and Husiak, and that was the first thing we did. <laughs> wow. It was called Gimp. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah, Chris Husiak walked in, and he was like, you ready? And he, like, un unzipped himself, and he and, and cut the curve, and he's like, all right, all right, man. And he put goggles on, and he's like got like speedos, and he's like <laughs> in his shower. And who's acts like, all right, and he like unzips, and it's like a fucking extinguisher because it was a an actual fire extinguisher. Wow! Like spraying, you know, <laughs> at God's end, which was such an asset, you know, for the first college short. Like, look yeah. at the spectacle of an effect. <laughs> Yeah, because they had a fire extinguisher filled with water, and it was just. <laughs> and Kirk was like, "Oh, <laughs> it was amazing." That sounds amazing. <laughs> and uh, let's see here. Blah, blah, blah. Duh, 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 duh. Comments, comments. We need the questions. Mm. Got a lot of comments. Oh, yeah, I got that one. Let's see here. It's weird. It's the um, is it end one? It's really weird. They were coming coming hard and fast. Let's see. Um, 
I've I've unstarred them as asking oh after asking the or putting them into the chat. Yeah. Or uh, visible to you guys. Do let's see here. This is a pretty interesting one from Dave Choppin. I'll wait until he gets back, though. Unless he can hear the... No, I think... It'd probably be best to wait until he comes back, so... Yeah, I think so. Let's see. <laughs> Yeah, there are some truly funny questions that uh, came in when I think it was toward the the live performance that you guys did, which was awesome. I really, I I really enjoyed that. It totally tripped me out. You know, I wasn't sure what was going on. I was like, "Oh, this must be that." We weren't too sure like what we were doing either because. Um... We just, at the last moment, decided, like, yeah, let's do some fun improv sound. Why not? Like, um, Yeah, that's awesome. And we wanted to have a run-through, but didn't get a chance because um just both been so busy. So this was truly improv, like... <laughs> yeah, it was, it was organic, you know? I you really, you know, you guys put yourselves right into it, you know, and that's... I got to respect that. Well, um, I know like the quality of the sound wasn't, probably wasn't great, like for the live, you know. Yeah, because we, we, we have different recorders recording it, so we sh should theoretically be able to make something cool. Yeah, we have yeah. Like, but very many recorders like around here. <laughs> that's the good thing, um, like for the final iteration of it. But yeah, we sure. have no idea what it sounds like. Or what we, or we did. Uh, you know, honestly, I mean, uh, it sounded good on my end. Like, through, oh, cool. You know, so I'd, it was easy to hear you guys, you know, question and answer. So here, let us see here. Dave Choppin asks, are you having an almost Van Beber look at 70s revenge flick? I love Van Beber as he knows, and he's he's sticking a thorn in my thigh because I started oh. showing you the documentary with Van Beber, and we didn't get to finish it. But that was when I was kind of in the background and you know applauding him and stuff yeah. like that. It's kind of pain, painful because you know Van Beber should should have been a filmmaker celebrated and. I agree. Regularly making films and everything. As anyone is familiar with his work, he should be just a working filmmaker. And he is one of the voices that inspired me in the 90s when I was sort of pursuing effects. And then I saw his movie. It was originally Charlie's Family and then it became Man the Manson Family commercially. Mm -hmm. It was a little more viable in that re regard. But I saw that work print for it, and it was like, that's an independent film. That's what it could be. Holy mm. fuck. That's what it could <laughs> be. It could be, uh, you know, like, it was everything that was so manifest of in my stomach, in my heart, in my every ounce of being, and uh, spoke to my soul and was just magic. And I remember meeting him and, and sharing in whatever degree I could and having our moment and everything. But uh, it was, you know, transformative seeing his work because there weren't, weren't many independent films that I saw that spoke to me in that way. But his did, his did. And they were very deep when you saw them and uh, most it was like, oh, they're, they're trying to do this. They're trying to do that. His 
it was the answer to why you could be independent and why you could break the voice of commercialism and Hollywood and and you could actually have your voice and do your thing and actually be bold and strong and and sound and and not feel lesser than it was fucking awesome you know he was the voice for that to 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 sing to that degree and there weren't any others really in that area um so i'm glad we got to share some good times that um particularly at cinema wasteland where he was ready to beat the shit out of a guy in a fucking panel and walked out and i was the one who walked out and we just had our moment outside and it was just artist artist and I don't know. You know, those are the moments that kind of keep you grounded and remind you of what you are and what you're doing. Wild yeah, stuff. What he did do is fucking sound. Yeah. And, and that's a shame he hasn't got to do more. It's real, real fucking shame. I understand. Have you ever seen that uh, crossover with uh, the Schizophreniac, uh, the Horror Mangler, the, the called Cuckoo Clocks of Hell? With uh, I don't know if it was co co directed by uh, Jim Van Bever, but I've wanted to see it. I've seen clips, but I haven't seen the full film. No. Okay. Okay. I've it's, wanted to see it. it seems to be very hard to come by. Uh, I know. Yeah. No. Totally. And I um not getting to be like a hardcore fan because you're trying to do yeah it's kind of a a double-edged sword at times but um stuff like that yeah i would i would love to see what that was because it seemed such a raw transformative time of that era yeah yeah, it always piqued my interest when I first heard about it, and uh, to know that it was like a like a crossover or something like that, yeah. or a, it was just so wild, and I could never find it for myself. To, I, I there's I don't know if there's a copy in the wild, or you know if anyone's selling it, if they've got it, so hard to come by. Yeah, yeah, it's it definitely hard because I. Um, that other director, he's like born again, so his other films are they're in a whole other camp. Um, oh, interesting, which, which adds to the mystique, <laughs> you know? sure. Hell yeah, okay. Um, hmm. uh, da da. Well, they, if Terrence, if you're still in the chat, thanks for coming out, man. And yeah, it seems as though some of our some of our viewers from across the pond are. Hold on, there may have been some new ones. Oh, this may be a easy one to answer, but. Stuart Johnson asks, will there be a mortem too? He's purposely like stirring the fucking pot. <laughs> oh shit. Was that a was that a loaded question or he know, he knows he's a cl close friend. He's a producer on All American Devil. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so um what has materialized to be the second part of Let's make a horror movie. Includes sort of snuff-like footage that we had started shooting. We were we started shooting a movie called Snuffy, hmm. and uh, production very much early on stopped. So it was kind of materials like unfortunately s s stalted by just life events. But after some time transpired, it 
transformative, transformatized. I don't even know the right words. Um, to become a better companion to horror movie, to become film as war. And there's a section where it falls into some home video type footage and it doesn't materialize to mortem, but it, it touches upon the very like grassroots, very real aesthetic of that. And Mm. we were overachieving in that department to a degree where I like I planned blackouts to where I was kind of a complete in uh, complete chaos of vomiting and eating like uh, cat food and being cool with it and, mm-hmm. and then being perky and back and laughing it was it quite oh oh we're the back sorry i don't know what happened there sometimes if uh if you accidentally press uh another another tab or something Stream yeah. Yards, boot you. Yeah, well, I'm, but I'm it, worried about that. My my phone, my phone, at least. I'm just, ju- yeah, my phone's on 13, percent but it's on my oh, charger. Shit. My charger is on 86. percent It should be fine. But technology, Damn. that's my my yeah. paranoia. I've got it on a charger. I understand. Um, I do that all the time myself with. Doing videos and such, or yeah, and I've got stuff. and the other camera I've got, which wouldn't be aesthetic, but I've, it's good if we switch to it, so we'll be good. Let's see here. Um, uh, what? Oh, wait, Lord Gary asks, have you have you done any martial arts movies? Did we? Was that already touched on? Kramer was going to touch upon that. I don't, know, I don't know if we did get into that. You talked about your martial arts experience. Okay, like, I, know yeah. had, I know he had like tried to address yeah. that. Like know. Kramer's question, like I was trying to pull it off my phone, but I didn't yeah. find it because it yeah. was a while ago that you sent it to me. Yeah. But... <sighs> yeah, so sorry, Kramer. I was trying to say word for word what you asked like a few weeks ago, but. No, I was just curious if because he asked the transference because of the uh, BMI and all that stuff. Uh-huh. But, but um, no, I um, I I do have like Goshen Jitsu and Taekwondo like several years when I was growing up, and those years were transformative of my sense of being and state of mind and um, awareness of my space. Uh, not so much on a general practicing level, but it, I, I spent enough time in that that ingrained a philosophy to be aware and be present and actually aware of the surrounding and moments mm-hmm. where, I mean, I've had guns to the back of my head when I was driving, like different moments where I could create a sense of calm and then project what was right in the situation to walk away where I was okay. Um, in that, um, I would love to put that, you know, sense of knowing it on, on, on screen. And I, I grew up a Van Damme kid. I loved Bruce Lee. I loved Van Damme was my hero in the eighties. So in the in the right situation, I don't. I, have you seen um, the movie he was in, The Bouncer? I haven't seen that one from Van Damme. Dude, that movie is so fucking good. Oh my god, it's so good. Awesome. I, I would be so proud if I directed them. That that's so such a good movie. Okay. Um, and then um, JCVD, the movie he was in, that was that would that that should have been an Oscar winning movie, but everybody was like. Well, he's blacklisted. 
oh, well, you know, we'll kind of re-accept him as a performer. Hmm. There is a moment in that movie. Have you seen JCVD? JCVD. What's that stand for? Is it is John Claude Van Damme? Oh, I've <laughs> seen I've seen like Bloodsport and uh... no, they're, yeah, they're all good. But JCVD, no, there is no. a moment the fucking camera comes down and he does a improv monologue. Oh. Your soul will be sucked up and fucking spat out, and you will be like, "Oh shit." <laughs> oh shit <laughs> oh wow and it it's amazing it, it's so good it's so good um i'm a fan i'm a i'm a fanboy since i was like a little teeny bopper but that moment anybody will appreciate it doesn't matter who you are sure but it sure. was improvised there was a scripted dialogue and and van Deb asked can i come from the heart and they were like, all right, we'll do one, you know, and that's what's in the movie. And it is it when you get to that point, if you are a fan of film, if you had a dream, anything, it will fucking wrench your heart. It is so powerful. It's so great. And it hits the boy of dreams of anything. It doesn't matter what your dream is. It hits that. Well, damn, I'm going to have to check that one out. But I had no idea. He could retire a happy man, you know. And that was sure. many years ago now, which is quite crazy. How is How in the fuck is that? It's so frustrating. I just want to... That's my technology. <laughs> take a second to yeah. say thank you for those who because we've got alice who it, i don't know if she's in the chat but it was 3 a.m for her like yeah. a while ago and then terence it was like 2 a.m for them like are there any specific questions they asked that we should um all right my heart i think Damn. terence is still here is there anything you want to ask like why are you still here because i know it's super late like Lionheart is fucking amazing. He's oh amazing. yeah, mm -hmm. that's a Batman movie. That's a fucking amazing. Movie. I'm, yeah. I cannot wait to rewatch Lionheart. I cannot wait. I had, it's been oh, there was a, a release recently that came out, and I've been dying to rewatch it. It's such a good film. I haven't seen it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god! It transformed my. Teenage years. <laughs> it's like later, later. <laughs> it's so wow. good. I mean, it's just the guy that washes up on shore and has a dream and fucking, you know, keeps his fucking family alive. Like, I work on the streets. It's a badass. Badass. Awesome. badass. Fucking badass. Fuck yeah. Well, shoot. Do you guys want to wrap it up, or you want me to still pull out some uh, unanswered questions? Any any, um, any specific questions? Yeah, we'll hit. If there's anything like which you're trying to look to. Yeah, like lowest budget short film. So Death by DVD. Um, I don't know if they're still in the chat, but hello. Um, so what is the lowest budget you have ever... Sorry. What, yeah, what is the lowest budget you have ever shot a film with? Uh, I don't think I'd like to talk about that. He has so, another, uh, <laughs> if you don't want to. <laughs> they're uncomfortably low, and it's not. Well, you say that, but then it's also kind of inspiring. I, I not do, kind of, but it is. Like... I, I do agree there is inspiration to that, but. Career-wise, it's quite befuddling okay. because, oh, you did that for ten dollars. You did that for five hundred dollars. You did that for fifty thousand dollars. You did that for fifty thousand dollars. You did that for five hundred thousand dollars. You did that for five hundred million dollars. 
equally across the board, you're now on a fucking hurdle mm-hmm. to where you're you're expected. You're expected at a lesser amount than what you're saying. You're bragging about. Well, it's just it's a stupid fucking industry to where there is when I okay grunt. This will be a good summary of this because it transformed me. And the, uh, if you, who who was this? Oh, sorry, Death by DVD. Not oh, not sure okay. what the name is. Okay, the, the 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 this did transform me, and this did set me on the path to believe I could do whatever. I was a teenager. My closest friend, who was my cousin, died in a freak car accident. My principal sought me in and said, what do you want to do with your life? I want to make monsters. I want to make special effects. He sent me off, gave me a day off of school. I got to go to Tom Savini's studio, take a day off, go to Pittsburgh. This day transformed my life. I wish this camera was rolling because this is so fucking, this is everything. When I got to meet Tom, he told me everything in my book. It doesn't matter. It's all textbook. Look around you. Anything you have is an illusion. Whatever you have to create, look around you. Anything can be created to create that. Create that. Put that on screen. Put that on set. It doesn't matter. That can be the thing. It doesn't matter if it's by the book, whatever. Most of what I've done is not by the book. That wasn't in the book because I was embarrassed. I didn't put that in the book because I wanted to make a credible book by text but from artist to artist look around you anything could be art and that transformed me that's heavy man not been able to capture that moment to that degree or actually acknowledge it but that that is fact that was a moment that changed me so it was it just was okay there's textbook and then there's what do we need to see what we need to see doesn't fucking matter. That's a whole other thing. That can be anything. It's what we can do. And with anything, you go from there. You don't need anything. You need you need what you need to see what you need to see. And you go from there. Often less is more. I mean, I relate to um, when my sisters and I, because we didn't grow up with a lot of money in that, and um, we used to watch the most horrific copies of horror movies. And we were all there, all of us, and all of our cousins were huddled, and um, with this little crappy quality and this little crappy screen, and like shifting ourselves you know um and then years later when i watched those films and like the proper quality it was like it's not as good but I, it's not the same but it's sort of you know that power of the illusion is so like magical yeah. and and i suppose just to reflect back on another point that you made about that sort of undercutting that takes place in so 
I'm um, a bit audio visual artist and do a lot of commission work and have known a lot of yeah just undercutting in that sense and it is something that aspiring like creatives need to think about like don't price yourself out because it's tempting to say like I will work for free but then there's also something to be said for realizing like the value of your work and realizing that you need to financially exist in this current world because it's more difficult now than it ever has been so I think I don't know for anyone listening I, I guess that's I mean I don't have an answer for that I don't know if you do either but it's just something to think about and to always sort of try and have conversations with each other about as well because it is important and it's a, you know a matter of how you survive as well isn't it so yeah um, death by DVD. Um, if you want to tell us your name, Death by DVD, I can address you by your name. <laughs> Don't have to. Though. <laughs> um, what is your dream collaboration? Oh God, there's so many dreams. I would love to work with so many artists that are still alive, but I can't say that as a dream. It's a matter of the right situation with the right artists that I do love. And that materializing to become a, a reality. And that would be a dream. But, you know, whether it was the right thing with Gaspar Noé or with David Lynch, it, it, it it would be situational to the right thing. Um, we even something with David Graham or Mike Props, like they're equal in the camp of people that I love. So it would be situational to, in the moment, be this is the dream in this moment. And there are many dreams in that moment, small and large. So I don't know that there is the dream. Thank you, Lord Gary, for <laughs> saying that you love the young lady with two tone coloured hair. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll sit. She was going to sit there. What was it? I know. It was oh, a while oh, ago. Yeah. Oh, was it a while ago? It was a bit ago. I was going to respond to it, but I thought maybe she's already, already in the land of Nod. <laughs> Good night, it didn't Alex. seem like it yeah. didn't seem like it was a good it was a good message. I thought it would be something to respond. I think it was before that. Maybe she hung on. No, that was Oh huh. Yeah, that was the one I think. Well, thank you for the kind words, Alice. Yeah, she'll watch the West show once she wakes up. <laughs> Well, <laughs> lovely to have you here. Um, Snuffy sounds like a Disney movie. Yeah, Snuffy was absolutely a Disney movie. That was the code name for our Snuffy movie, which we called the camera by. It was a camera. Um, and now it's a part of Filmless War, which is the companion for Let's Make a Horror Movie, which is cool. It has a home because there was some wonderful footage that would have just never been seen. And as time had its place, it's like, wait, there's actually a place for this. And it goes from indie film thing to faux, faux camera sort of uh, 
whatever you want to call it, and then back and just sort of like transform it into different varieties of film styles. And it's really fucking cool because um, it kind of dips into that mortem aesthetic because it's like hand hand shot um but but it does in a way where you're not you know just sort of getting your goods and going home mm -hmm. you know it's still sort of like we're just trying to home video you know we're not going that far we're just we're dipping our toes but um and and it's back to the races and i, I don't know it's um it's like a means to like bring it full circle it's fucking cool it's uh because that was going to be a project that was going to bring it full circle and where it was going to go was quite fucking horrific but you know it lost its its pacing and it was what it was but it fit the mold of an existing thing so it's great so it exists in a world so it's not lost it's not a lost venture and it all has its place which is which is fucking awesome. I'm glad everything has its place because it's all part of the journey. It was all magic. I was puking into a little thing and eating, eating <laughs> kit, kit, kitty, kitty, uh, like, like, um, um, what is it? Um, Cats eat the, uh, the cat food. Uh, I don't think you have to elaborate any more than cat food. Well, cat food but it was, uh, but yeah, I was like nibbling cat food. Like, did you get back oh, yeah. uh, after like, you know, like that's where I got myself, like performance-wise. Like, I, I purposely put myself to where, within the people that were involved, they they knew I was going there, and mm -hmm. and we did, and we went to this length to where I'm like vomiting and out of my mind and then I'm being fed cat food and and it's okay. I'm nibbling cat food and it's great um, performance one. So Wesley put like a question in the yeah. chat that there was one about Mr. Ben, if you could pull that up. Yeah. I think because that was kind of interesting. That was one of the ones I remembered from early yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, so once you started working with Mr. Ben, did he become a Maggot Films exclusive actor or did you branch out and work with other filmmakers and or other friends in the field of filmmaking? There was, um, Ben was essentially retired when I met him and he was working locally. And through our meeting, it was a resurgence of his personality and he got to work on more films. And the films we worked on, we found places for him. He did voiceovers. Mostly it was voiceover work on Slay Hamster. And uh, he played a character. He played um, like the, the father of the killer in uh, um, Rob Hall's films. Oh, I want to lose, lose uh, traction. Oh, that's killing me. Oh man, I can't. I can't even believe I'm forgetting. Them. That's one of the things with this zoo, like this tangibleness of. Uh... <sighs> what is the name? Oh, it's the tip of my tongue. He, he was in the cover of Fangoria. It was so good. But it played the father of this killer. We shot a sequence in Pittsburgh, and he did voiceovers on a couple of films. He did the voiceover on uh, um, uh, oh Christ, ah, uh, ah, oh, man, that's rough. Twenty some years ago. Yeah, there were there were bit parts. I mean, he was in Size of the Lions. 
He was cut down. He had a big, big sequence in Silence of the Lambs. He was cut down. He was in Two of the Lies. He was, he was cut completely out. He has a great credit because of Union. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, um, the time we were uh, apart, like we, he was a part of our films, but there were films that surged that we were a part of, and then we would have involved him integrally. And it was a uh, huge, uh, in mutually inspiring because it felt like we were a family. Laid to rest. That's Rob Saul's films. Good lord. <laughs> that fucking killed me. Because Rob passed in 2020. That's why it's hard to recall. Yeah. He laid to rest too. Yeah, Ben was the father of a killer in the opening when we shot that movie for Mother. Got mm, better. Better. Kirk Owen. Mm, better. <laughs> I agree. Um, okay. Dave Joppin. <laughs> The baby from Eraserhead grew up to become Maggot of Morden. <laughs> no wonder I had such an affinity with the baby from Eraserhead. It all makes sense now. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> okay. Um, what was it like to work with a human cockroach like me, Kirk? <laughs> Like, no cock. No. Well, we both came from cockroaches. I mean, to be honest, we lived amongst them at Allegheny Center. So, yeah, I'm saying that I know what he means. Oh, okay. We came from that. Like, we were just like struggling, like, hab happenstances from the small towns. That was the reality. That was our, our fumble beginnings. And, uh, yeah, we bothered over that. He hurts. We, we are well. Cl clearly, I'm the um, maggot standing, and Kirk is the roach beyond the better half of your existence. Oh. We we are like against all odds still like pushing and Kirk I mean I'm not gonna list your your battle because that's yours to say but you're a fucking hero and you are right now. Yeah. a friend from from beginning that keeps me going. A fucking hero. If anybody can inspire to be fucking Kirk Owen. This is Kirk Persistency. Of course, man. <laughs> well, I've only met you once, Kirk, but from what I've heard, yeah. You're a superhero. No. Not all superheroes wear underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for Kirk's response to that one. Now I'm like. <laughs> and also, Kramer, like. We had so many of your questions, but they vanished, and yeah, I'm glad we got to answer a couple. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we, we were trying to address them beforehand, too. And I had um, pulled up a question that you asked, and I'd said, like, this has been worded, like, so awesomely. Um, I'm going to just read it out as is, but couldn't really find it on my phone, so... 
Yeah. But yeah, glad we got to answer a couple of them. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're all awesome. Yeah, totally. <laughs> what do you think the what do you think the Academy Awards ignore sorry. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I love you, Kirk, for that reason. <laughs> um, so, to this serious question, why do you think the Academy Awards ignores horror movies and its icons, such as Tom Savini and Robert England? Oh no, where's the question gone? Um, it's every 10, 20 years, they're reminded, and then they 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 make a right of a wrong and you know one that was an influence had a right of a wrong although he worked on a wrong which was rick baker he worked on the exorcist it should have gotten an oscar yeah. and then they and then they awarded american law from london for makeup effects so he got an award because he he only, oh, uh, like, assisted on the Exorcist, but that was fucking Dick Smith, the Godfather of fucking effects. And Rick was awarded, and you think he'd be set for life? No. Retirely, fuck this because his shit was painted up. But, yeah. you know, flash forward in every ten twenty years they are reminded and and it's a weird fucking industry because you know there is incredible fucking makeup and main, the main artists that should have been awarded are slated and then somebody sometimes as Rick deservedly did get awarded but um, it is quite unfortunate in that degree and, and it does thing but at least some that sang mm -hmm. got acknowledged because it is it's really and um the other thing i have a, a close affinity to is editing mm -hmm. how do you acknowledge somebody that edited the best film you don't know the conditions you don't fucking know like, yeah. like for me personally, of all of the things I've done, opening the mind, 80 tapes, you're talking 160 hours plus more footage. How on earth do you, do you, do you transform that as a condition to a film that was shot on a regular format to where they had, you know, 30 days and there is so much yeah. regular footage and you know you can't compare the sort of sort of things yeah completely and i think like i mean we saw a film recently that was shot on film yeah and i think as a regular sort of cinema goer you know that just sort of you know you're there to watch it you don't know anything about the processes you can't tell it's magic yeah but i feel like and then learning <laughs> yeah Oh my God! What was it? Twenty days and eight day, eight, eight hours a day, but with 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 transport because it was union. They he only had the kids for six hours a day. Can we mention what that is? F fire, yeah. Regular yeah. fire. Regular fire, yeah. It, like, and shot at sixteen millimeter. Yeah, and it's incredible. I think, like, if I watched that film, just not knowing any of the processes, like, I really loved it personally. But yeah. Knowing like the process behind it was like mind blowing, and it. I feel yeah, there's just not enough like recognition for the processes involved in things that we consume. Yeah, like without thinking, and that is part of the magic. But yeah, like it's a good point to think about. 
because and it's in in all sectors you know like when you listen to music I don't think people understand how many hours goes into you know editing like anything like with audio and I'm saying that as a musician and somebody that does a lot of audio editing work and it's put hours and hours and hours into like something that's like five minutes long and so on and I know that yeah it's a similar kind of um work process in the sense that the hours that you put in and um yes shout out to all the people Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Oh, good night, Kirk. <laughs> Murder mysteries. <laughs> Awesome. Really, really good. Yeah, really good seeing everybody. Yes. Thank you so much for everybody that's stayed with us. Like, appreciate all of you so much. Yeah, it's nice to have kind of a down, down play because I don't, I don't even remember it, but after the performance and that, I, it was sort of an auto, auto mon version. I think you're downplaying it. I, no, I don't. I don't have any memory of it. it. That's what I mean. Like, it was just, I was, I don't know, it was a, a building to a moment of just, just giving to the moment. And then, and then we led to us doing our little thing. But it, but it was all like an exercise, you know, exercise of the demons. And just mm-hmm. letting go and not, not really thinking. I think that their device may have run out of juice, but um, we can spend some time. Um, waiting to see if they'll come back if you guys want um it's turned into a monster of a stream lengthwise i wanted to step back out there because they seem to be you know talking amongst themselves and i didn't want to just sit there and you know nod my head and comment um oh thank you terrence it's all them, really. I mean, they made the show what it was. Maggot forever, indeed. Hell yeah. Bill, I tried to circle back to your stuff, and um, if they return, um, I uh, I tried to highlight the questions you had from earlier that uh, that either hadn't been really touched on um, I was trying to be fair to everyone that put a question in the chat. Terrence Cowabunga, brother. Thank you so much. You know, the, the real hard part of the stream was all them. They, they made it themselves. You know, they, it might be a rap, uh, Bill. Um, while I kind of um, talk with you guys, close up the show, if they decide to come back, then we will, you know, continue on. And, you know, what it, it it's probably the device that they were using to, uh, to uh, stream with, that one that had both of them in camera, it probably ran out of juice. Oh, there they are. There they are. Mm-hmm. 
camera. Hello. Probably ran out of juice. Oh, there they are. Okay, cool. There they are. Making the camera. Hello. Probably ran out Hi. Hi. Just there they are. Just turn it up. Hello. Yeah, I guess we should probably yeah, turn it wrap now. up. <laughs> it's been quite a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Wes. Um, yeah, yeah no, thank I, you. I, um, well, it's, it's funny because I had I had my phone that I had it running off on a power bank, but it just deleted itself to nothing. Oh, no. Tech and I, I've got it against the power bank, which still had power, but for whatever reason, it Hence why I had everything run out, running off of power, not power. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, to avoid these things. But um, we got it up and going enough to see. And we had the um, iPad still with you running. It's been like uh, three and a half hours. Thank you so much, Wes. Like, like, oh, thank, thank you. you. You've been this awesome. Been... It's super awesome. Like, thank you. Well, hey, I hope that Turn I was able on. to get oh, some more. Oh, God. Now, hang on. Ah. Oh, sorry, I can't. We can't hear you. Oh. Honestly, it's, it, I've got to thank I've got to thank you guys. Oh, and uh, thank you for doing this. This was try turning the hand. Okay. Uh, show it. Show it. Yeah. You guys, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> Damn it! Oh, <laughs> there it is. Okay, cool. Well, I was just saying thanks. The thanks go to you guys. Thank you for coming out this evening. I at the at the end there. I don't know if it's coming to it all, but I wanted to take a step back because it seems like you guys were getting into the, you know, the more personal stuff, and I didn't want to. I wanted you guys to be full screen, so. More personal stuff tonight. I didn't want to. I wanted you guys to be full screen. So, I'm so sorry. There's a crazy delay. Uh, oh, no. But let me see if I can fix that somehow. I'm so sorry. There's a crazy delay. Oh, no. Ooh. Oh, I wish we could get it on the iPad. <laughs> Oh, is that better? <laughs> okay. Um, I was kind of trying to mess with the the no, audio of the sound of it. Sweet. Oh, oh you can't hear me again. Up. Yeah, I think that's probably the only thing we can do. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the only thing we can do. Oh, <laughs> well, maybe if you watch the if you watch the replay. <laughs> Then uh, well, basically, I was just, the, I wasn't sure if you guys were coming back or what. So I just kind of uh, was trying to, I was just trying to keep it going. Um, and if you guys came back, then, you know, we could continue. But it has become a monster of a this long stream. If you guys came back, then, you know, we could continue. But. It has become a monster of a just long street. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for bearing with us and like thanks for waiting for us as well. Like that's so cool of you. Yeah. Oh, thank it's my so pleasure. It's getting trippy, man. <laughs> this is the, the, the second row. <laughs> Look at Dave as the same. Well, this has been quite a lot of fun. I'm gonna. I just had to. I'm trying to reduce the feedback there, but uh, I wanted to tell you guys thank you for doing this it was a brilliant idea and if we do this again or if you do it you know anywhere else we'll maybe able to fix out the uh the bugs in the the system and i thought Streamyard had their echo problem canceled altogether but oh and dave says loves you guys what a sweetheart let me see if i 
here. Whoops, you guys. <laughs> Bless my heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the delay went on. So should we we call this? <laughs> <laughs> Should we call this the the the, the end <laughs> sign off? We call what do you guys say? Yes. Yep. Yep. Good okay. night, okay. wives. Good night, you guys. You <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Much love. This has been a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful experience. So. Good night, you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for coming up. Much love. This has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. So. Good night. Good night. Thanks for coming up. It's been a great time. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, you guys. It's been a great time. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, you guys. It's been a great time. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. Good night to all you wonderful people in the chat. Thank you for sticking around. And hope they might have one last thing to say. Chat. Oh, thank uh, you for staying no, around. No, no, okay. <laughs> and hope they might have one last thing to say. Oh, oh. For no, around. no, okay. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> Good night, everyone. We will end the stream, but thank you so much for coming out. Thanks to Michael and Indy, or Lucifer Sky, that is. Michael Todd Schneider. It's a wonderful.